Welcome friends, this is Mike Williams. For those that follow my work on the Beatles conspiracy, you are probably aware of the mystery surrounding the identity of Billy's biological parents. This is a piece of the puzzle that has yet to be solved. Although some will point to Alistair Crowley as Billy's biological father, that premise remains unproven, even though the narrative in memoirs could lead the reader to come to that conclusion. But what if the Crowley angle is a dead end, and one of the fictional threads contained within the book to make the identity of Billy's parents more challenging? In this interview, Stacy, who was a Beatles researcher, puts forth a case based on other more subtle clues contained in memoirs that points the reader in a completely different direction as to who Billy's parents might be. Stacy contacted me a number of months ago and explained she believed she figured out the identity of Billy's parents. She then emailed me a summary of her findings and I found her research to be compelling. I asked Stacy if she would be willing to present her findings and she agreed. Her journey took her back to William Wallace, Sir William Douglas, Robert the Bruce, Sir James Douglas, and the 14th Duke of Hamilton. And so without further ado, here's Stacy. Before we get started though, Stacy, what I'd like to ask you is, how did you get started in this whole McCartney and Beatles conspiracy bit? On YouTube, your video, Did the Beatles Write Their Own Music, popped up for me. Uh, I saw that I knew instantly because Rubber Soul was my favorite album. There's no way they put that together in 30 days. I don't know anything about music, but I knew you were right on with that. So that's what got me started. But that's when I bought the book and I've watched your videos ever since. Okay. Yeah. So that video was back in April of 2020. And then you you bought the book after that. I did buy the book after that. What did you think of the book when you started reading it? Just out of curiosity. Well, it took me time to wrap my head around it. Because at first I doubt, is this, are they really two people? Really? And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over time, I mean, you see the ears and all the evidence, and yes, they're two different people. And I just really dove into the book. But you know how it is. You dive into it, and then you have to walk away for a while because it's just too much. Yeah, it can get a bit dark, right? Dark. Yeah. I tell the audience the same thing, that there are dark aspects of the book, and sometimes you just have to put it down and then come back to it. Now, I mentioned... Before we got started here, Stacy, that the book strongly alludes to Crowley possibly being Billy's father. I, I never said definitively that Alistair Crowley was his father because that's true. The book was leaning into it, but I just could not grab onto something that I thought was hard evidence. And I never thought that he was his father because of uh, Barbara Bush. I don't think he's her father. Young Barbara Bush looks a lot like young Marvin Pierce. Mm. So to me, it was just to sidetrack us or to maybe get us to revere Aleister Crowley somehow. Whether Crowley is his uh, biological father or not, and I, you're going to show us that he's not, Crowley's influence on Billy in his life, I think, is very significant. Yes. Yeah. So that piece of it, in my mind, is still very important. So to get started here, what clues did you find? How did you put together what you're going to show us? Because I think it's an extremely good piece of work. Well, it started when, you know, we were trying to figure out who the father was, which you concentrate on the Sir William chapter. That's all about William Wallace. But that didn't make sense because William Wallace left no children. And so I started concentrating on that chapter, I started looking at the people around William Wallace to see if there were any clues. And I found this Sir William Douglas, William the Hardy, which is my first big clue. Oh, the Hardy. Now his father was named William and his son was named James. So then I got it into my head. Well, since Billy's son is named James, maybe Billy's father is also named William. Well, in the book, it tells us about the Hardy warrior. Right. And the thing about this William the Hardy, he was the first nobleman to join William Wallace in his fight for Scottish independence. Okay, so, so they, what the image you're showing us here of William Douglas, is this the person we're talking about? Yes, that's Sir William Douglas the Hardy, and uh, his son is named James. So 
after he dies, his son, he was first lieutenant to Robert the Bruce. So the story goes that when Robert the Bruce was dying, he asked the good Sir James, was his nickname, he asked him to take his heart to Jerusalem for burial. And they say that James, the good Sir James wore Robert the Bruce's heart in a silver casket around his neck for the rest of his life. He intended to do that. It would never happen. He was killed, I think, in Spain. Okay, so just back up a second to make sure I'm connecting dots here. So Sir James Douglas is the son of... William the Hardy. Okay, and just to repeat what you said before, William Hardy's connection to William Wallace is... He was the first nobleman to join William Wallace in his fight for the Scots. Okay. The English. Okay, so that's the connection back to William Wallace. Right. And then it continued with his son being the first lieutenant to Robert the Bruce. Okay. So with his name, his nickname being James the Good, it makes me think of that line in the book. It's in bold. It says, I want a good heart. And then I think of the song Heart of the Country. So after he wore that heart and a casket around his neck, and you can see it in that image there. In the statue right by his chest area. Yeah. And it was after that, they added a heart to the arms of the Douglas family. Before that, it was just the three stars. So because of the good Sir James and Robert the Bruce, they added this heart. And that also makes me think of the, you know, that art show he did. There were so many paintings in that art show Queen Elizabeth went to. But anytime you see an image of the Queen at that art show, they're always and only in front of this painting of a heart, back to heart of the country. Right. And again, folks, for those of you that are not familiar with Billy's solo career, he has a song, Heart of the Country. I think it's off the Ram album. And so then I'm wondering, well, what's all this about Wallace? Why is the whole chapter concentrating on Wallace? So I looked up the definition of the the name meaning of Wallace, and it means foreigner or stranger. And it also says in that chapter, I was a descendant of an extremely different Sir William. It must be somebody else. And he also says in that chapter that his great-grandparents were named John and Arlene Crawford. Now, John means blessed by God. Arlene means pledge or promise. And Crawford, the English meaning is crossing of the crows. But the Gaelic meaning is crossing of the blood, which... I think you can take to mean a blood oath, too. So now I see these names as really nothing more than a metaphor, some of them. Okay. And then I started to wonder, well, is there still a Lord Douglas? Is it still a title? Is that still a thing? And that's when I found the the Lord Douglas at the time, the year of Billy's birth, was this Alfred Douglas Hamilton. And let me first explain how those names were hyphenated. So in the 1600s, the second Duke of Hamilton left only a daughter as an heir, Anne, and she married William Douglas, Lord of Selkirk, and then they became the Duke and Duchess of Hamilton, Lord Douglas Hamilton. So that's how those names got hyphenated. Okay, so make sure I follow. So on the left is Anne Hamilton. Yes. She married? She married... Lord Douglas, Earl of Selkirk. So he was from the Douglas clan because she was her father's only heir. So at that point, they just hyphenated the names and that's how those families joined. Okay. So on the right, we have Earl of Selkirk. Right. And he's from the Douglas clan. Okay. But then he adopted that name. They hyphenated it. So the Hamiltons and the Douglas is now, they've come together. They've come together. And I've read that it's one of the most titled families in all of the UK. Because when they joined those two families, a lot of titles came with it. Well, Alfred here, he inherited the title from his fourth cousin, William, who only left a daughter as an heir. And William left his daughter most of the lands, but he left the title to his fourth cousin, Alfred, Hamilton Palace and a million dollars in debt. I would have said no thank you, but he took it. And he had been a sailor 
And then he was suddenly the 13th Duke of Hamilton. Okay. So you have to excuse my, my slowness here. So the 13th Duke of Hamilton, which I'm looking at right now. Yes. How does that relate to the prior slide? So Anne and William in the 1600s, that's when the families joined. So he's just a descendant of these two. Okay. That's how the names were hyphenated. And that's how he ended up. His name was Alfred Douglas Hamilton. He got the title from his fourth cousin. And his fourth cousin left him the title because his fourth cousin only left a daughter as an heir. And rather than leave the title to her and her husband, he chose to leave it to his fourth cousin, which is pretty distant relative. I mean, Alfred was just a sailor. And then suddenly he's the premier peer of Scotland. It sounds like they didn't want to leave the title to a woman. It almost sounds like he had to seek out a male within the family bloodline. Yes. But I mean, unlike Anne in the 1500s, William chose to keep it in the bloodline with the paternal bloodline, the male bloodline. Okay. But he did leave most of the land to his daughter and a million dollars in debt to Alfred, which- Yeah. Wow. What a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hamilton Palace, too, which was quite a structure, but they ended up tearing it down in the early 1900s because there was coal mines underneath that compromised the structure. So even that didn't benefit him much. So we're looking at the 13th Duke of Hamilton right now. So his tenure was 1895 to 1940. So that's the period of time when he was the 13th Duke. Yes. And so he was the Duke when Billy was born. Okay. And so that's kind of why I focused on him. I just wanted to know if that still, if Lord Douglas still existed. And there it is. When did he die? Do we know? Uh, 1940. And then his son, Douglas Douglas Hamilton, became the Duke. He became the 14th Duke of Hamilton. Okay, Alfred. He married Nina Mary Benita Poor. And that kind of gets my attention because of. In the book, it says, William was born a poor young country boy. And Tom's footnote says, well, of course, William was born young. But I'm looking at this name, her maiden name, Poor, and wondering if that's a clue. So three years before Nina married Alfred, her brother, Robert, married Alfred's sister, Flora. They had no children. But he got my attention because he was born in Dublin, and he played cricket for South Africa, which brings up the line, have you ever noticed the pipes line sung on the Let It Be album? And I'd looked into that a long time ago. And what that is, it's John Lennon on the Let It Be album singing, Oh, Danny Boy, the old Savannah's calling. Yeah. Well, with Robert being born in Dublin, he's a Danny boy, plays cricket for South Africa, Savannah. But then I wonder... Do pipes, do pipes have anything to do with cricket? I didn't know anything about cricket. I looked up cricket and pipes, and yes, they use what they call pipes in cricket to secure the netting or the chain link fencing to create enclosures to keep the ball in a certain boundary. So pipes is a thing in cricket. And I'm thinking this is, this is who he's talking about. So back to Nina. Nina, two years after she married Alfred, she co-founded the Anti-Vivisection Society. And in the dictionary, it says the only people that use that word vivisection are people that are against it. And it's people that are against the use of animals in scientific testing. She was an animal rights activist. Okay. And then I wonder, well, I wonder if did that influence Billy to create a character named Viv? Because here's this woman, maybe she cares more about animals being protected from experiment than people. <laughs> she also, in World War II, she used a, ha a Douglas Hamilton property called Fern House as an animal sanctuary. And it was to protect the pets of wealthy Londoners during the Blitz. And you know how Wikipedia gets edited. That's how it was described when I first found this. Since then, it's been edited a, a many times to make her sound altruistic, as if she was just getting animals off the street. But I believe the first version, it was just for wealthy London families. Yeah, that's the thing 
about Wikipedia that folks have to be aware of. Whenever I look something up, Stacy, I actually save it as a PDF because I have found instances myself when I was doing the research or as I do the research where I would go back to a Wikipedia entry and I noticed that, well, the wording was changed. It's unreliable as far as that goes, but it's good for birth dates and death yeah. dates. Yeah, the basic information. Yeah. Okay, she dies January 51 at age 72. Yes. So I'm looking around Alfred and Nina's children and grandchildren, and I still don't know if I'm looking for a mother or the father. And I still had in the back of my mind, maybe Billy's father is named William. I don't find a William, but I find their grandson, James, who was born in 1942. He's on the left. He's the current Baron of Selkirk. And I'm thinking, wow, they have the same chin. Maybe they're cousins. Yeah, you could see the resemblance. It's it's interesting you should um, you should point this out. I had the image previously that you sent me of, on the left, that's who on the left? That's James Douglas Hamilton. He's the current Baron of Selkirk. Okay. So I did the same thing. I compared it to an image of Billy, a different one, but when Billy was older. And the older images are a little easier to do the uh, compare because a lot of the stuff that was done as far as plastic surgery and cosmetics and all that stuff, it doesn't hold together as well right? as he got older. So more of his natural features are emerging or coming through. And uh, so I, I looked, I did the same compare and I noticed, in fact, I brought my wife in. I asked her, do these two people, she knows uh, who Billy is, do they look similar to you? She goes, oh, absolutely. Yes. And I'm just, you know, James' parents were married in late 37 and they had five boys. So I was thinking, well, maybe they're cousins. But then I find this young picture of James and I, wow, he looks just like Viv. Look at the jawline. Yeah, that is a wow. And I think maybe they're more than cousins. Maybe they're half brothers. Maybe Billy is... Douglas Douglas Hamilton's illegitimate son. Oh, that's crazy. Until November, December 37. When I first saw this picture of James, I thought he looks just like uh, Viv, but I wanted to find an image of Viv that would work. And I, so I think I got it from a music video. Oh, and then there in the book, he's, Billy says, I look like James. He's talking about his son, James, but maybe he's also talking about his half brother, James. He looks more like, the Baron of Selkirk than he does even his own son, really. I mean, he looks like his son. If we take a look at Vivian Stanshall, we're talking about the Stanshall folks. And I, I always have to say this because because I always have to say it. <laughs> we're talking about the version of Vivian Stanshall that played in the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Ennis. And there were at least two versions of Stanshall. There was the, the version that Billy played in the Bonzos. And there was Victor Stanshall, who Billy had on his payroll to play the Stanshall character. So that Billy could have his McCartney character and his Stanshall character coexist. The version of Stanshall that you're looking at right now is Billy from the Bonzos. Yeah. So then I think, well, if, if he's Douglas Douglas Hamilton's illegitimate son, James' half-brother, let's look at Douglas Douglas Hamilton. He's one of the most fascinating characters in all of this. So this would be his father now? This is B, who I'm thinking of maybe his father. Okay. Okay, and you say he's illegitimate child, and the reason why you're saying that is because... Billy says he was born in 1937. Douglas Douglas Hamilton married in November, December 1937, and they had five boys. The oldest was Angus, born in 38. So if he's his son, he was an illegitimate son. I'll show later that he was he was illegitimate. James wrote a book about his father. He's written a couple books. And in one of James' books, it has a photograph of his parents' wedding. They're coming out of the St. Giles Cathedral. And it was November 37, James says. And anything else you see on the, on the internet, it says they were married in December. If I tend to believe James, he would know when his parents were married. So I think it was November Okay. It was a, you know, white wedding, a big formal affair. The premier peer of Scotland's getting married. 
Okay, mm-hmm. and you're going to show us why you believe that Billy is the illegitimate oh, yes. child yeah. of the Duke of Hamilton. Of the 14th Duke of Hamilton. Okay. So he's interesting. He's um, He was a boxer, a champion boxer, a pilot. His three brothers were pilots. They were all in the Royal Air Force in World War II. Douglas was Commodore in the Royal Air Force, a very young Commodore. And then this story, I never knew about this from World War II, but Rudolf Hess flew to Scotland in 1941 in an effort. He wanted to a message sent to Churchill. He was trying to stop the war. Right. It was 1941. So Douglas was the Duke at the time. He was looking for Douglas, Douglas Hamilton. He wanted him to take a message. He crashed his plane. So there was a big controversy about it. Like, how did you know him? He said, I never met him personally, but he knew about him because at the 1936 Berlin Olympics, they both attended the same banquet. Hess always maintained that, no, I never met Douglas Douglas Hamilton. And for Douglas Hamilton, it was a sensitive subject. People were saying, well, you were working with him beforehand. And, but it it never went anywhere because, but it's a sensitive subject to the family. Um, they want to make sure that Douglas Hamilton is cleared of any question about knowing Rudolf Hess beforehand. All it was, was they were at, they attended the same very large banquet in 1936 at the Berlin Olympics. Now his son, James wrote two books about his father, and they're both about this incident. The incident with Hess. The incident with Hess. Okay. So the other reason Hess said he sought out Douglas Douglas Hamilton in particular was because he'd known about him. Douglas Douglas Hamilton in 1933 wanted to do an expedition over Mount Everest. So in 19, it was a famous flight. It was they had dangerous they had open cockpits and it was a very dangerous so he was well known for this at the time um the first thing he did he sought funding for it and he got that funding from a wealthy london widow lucy lady houston she started out as a chorus girl ended up one of the wealthiest women in london she gave him the money she funded this expedition and they took two planes four men One of the men was a cinema photographer. He made a documentary about this expedition. It came out in 1934, and it won the Oscar in 1934 for Best Documentary, and it was called Wings Over Everest, which, of course, brings up, I saw that interview with Billy, with Howard Stern, where he says, we considered naming Abbey Road album Everest, which odd when you hear it at the time, why Everest? So I don't know if he's if that really happened or if he's just dropping a clue. Well, and he also has his live album, Wings Over America. So maybe that's also a play on Wings Over Everest. Yes. And the tour uh, Wings Over the World, which got canceled in 1980 after he was arrested in Japan. So just more clues for me. They're adding up. So let's go back to Nina. Nina to me looks a lot like Stella. I've always thought there's something in Stella's eyes. It looks like there's something else behind him, something or someone else behind her eyes. And Nina has the same eyes, the same look in her eyes. Also, their noses are very similar, especially the tip. Maybe not so much in this photo. We see other photographs of Nina. She looks a lot like Stella in the eyes and the nose. And I found out later Stella's middle name is Nina, Stella Nina. Oh, okay. Very interesting. (laughs) It's interesting. So at this point, I'm. this has got to be his father. But it's still speculation, right, on my part. And I feel like I got confirmation in the music video. It was made in 1979, a wonderful Christmas time music video. At one point, there's four diamonds that come out of the sky, and it's like they're in formation as if they're planes coming in for a landing into the runway. And I'm thinking, are those supposed to be, is that like Lucy's diamonds in the sky? There were four men on that expedition. There's four diamonds. As soon as they're out of sight because they land, a white horse 
appears in the sky. Now, those two airplanes they took on that expedition had Pegasus engines. And Pegasus, of course, in Greek mythology is a white stallion. Um, later in the video, a woman in 1950s hair and dress, 1950, early 50s fashion, get, gets out of a car. She picks up a toy, a wind-up toy dog, and cradles it as if it's real. Uh, of course, Nina died in 1951 and was an animal rights activist. I'm thinking, is that supposed to be symbolic of Nina? And to me, I, I this is confirmation that he was putting out there as early as 79 that this is his family. There are other images of Billy with a pale horse as well. Not just in the video here. I, I've seen other images where on his farm. Oh, yeah. I didn't think of that. And maybe there's a lot more behind the mythology of Pegasus than just the engines being Pegasus engines. There could be, but I think that the association that you made is valid. So for me, that's confirmation. I think this is his father. I think he's his son. A couple more things about him. He was in the 60s. He was director of Scottish aviation. I didn't know airplanes were so big in Scotland, but it's kind of a big deal, Scottish aviation. And uh, in 1969, Scottish aviation came out with an, an aerobatic aircraft called the Bulldog. And you think of the song, Hey Bulldog, there's a line in it that says, jackknife in your sweaty hands. Well, jackknife was a maneuver, a really hairy maneuver that these aerobatic planes did. And of course, in the book, it says that John Lennon was sort of seeing, you could, if you're lonely, you can talk to me. The Bulldog didn't go into production until 69, but Angus Hamilton, Douglas Hamilton's son, was test piloting that thing as early as 67. So before the song came out, it was being test piloted. Yeah, because the song was released in 1968. So maybe Billy kind of wrote that, if you're lonely, you can talk to me, for his brother Angus. Um, also, in the Magical Mystery Tour, where he says, "I there's another disguise, I'm in another disguise in that movie. And during I Am a Walrus, there's an airplane. And I'm thinking maybe he's in that airplane. I think that's the disguise. It was during I Am a Walrus. And during that song, during the music video, too, it's there's an airplane flying around in the sky. The whole family, they were pilots. And it's possible for someone to get, in the United States, it's possible for someone who's blind in one eye to get a pilot's license. You can't be a commercial pilot, but you can get a pilot's license. And all of those boys in that family, they're all pilots. You know, another airplane connection. Stacy, and it's mentioned in the book, in the footnotes, I think it's the footnotes, where he claims that he was in an airplane on a tarmac on 9-11-2001. Yes. And so was Leonard Cohen, or he was there. Yeah. So I'm just saying it's another airplane connection. Yeah. Another thing about Douglas Douglas, his brother, who was the Baron of Selkirk of his day, his name was George. And George was intelligence for Royal Air Force during World War II. And remember in the book, it says, Billy says it was his uncle that called George Martin to say, it's my nephew that's going to play this role on a permanent basis. So if he was intelligence in World War II, he definitely outranked George Martin. So maybe it was Uncle George that made that phone call. So his uncle is the brother of Douglas Douglas Hamilton. And his father has a brother named George, and that would be Billy's uncle. And Uncle George called George Martin and said, hey, my nephew is going to be the guy that's going to fill the role. Yes. And so this is the 14th Duke of Hamilton. Remember, that family has many, many titles. Well, they always give the title Baron of Selkirk to, not to the Duke, but they give it to another son. So in his day, Uncle George was the Baron of Selkirk. And James is the current Baron of Selkirk. So I'm satisfied at this point that that's his father. But I'm reading that line on page 20. My mother called Mary here, like Paul's, died when I was young. 
So I think, well, we're never going to know who the mother is. It's not going to be possible, but I can't help but still continue to look around the family. And I see that Douglas Douglas Hamilton's wife was Elizabeth Percy. And that reminds me of Percy Thrillington. And I think, well, okay, is this a stab at his stepmother? Maybe she didn't want her husband's illegitimate son around her five boys and Billy felt set aside, sort of sacrificed. Maybe this is kind of a stab at her. When did his father pass away? 1973. Okay. So he was around for a pretty long time. Yeah, he was around to see what happened with the Beatles. Yep. Right into the into the wings period. Right into the wings period. So I can't know. I just go deeper into this Elizabeth because her maiden name was Percy. It's another clue to me. Also, Elizabeth's mother's name was Helen. And he does say in the Sir William chapter that his grandmother's name was Helen. He said she was the one that entered his name in the family Bible when he was born. Well, he has the song Helen Wheels as well. And Helen Wheels. Was she Helen Wheels? I think maybe she was. So Elizabeth, she was the daughter of the 8th Duke of Northumberland, and her mother was Helen, who was the daughter of the Duke of Richmond, which when a daughter of a duke marries a duke or an heir to a duke, it's called a ducal marriage. There's only 24 non-royal dukedoms in the UK, so it's sort of a rare thing to have a ducal marriage. Of course, Elizabeth had a ducal marriage, too, because she was the daughter of a duke and married the heir to a duke. So this is a powerful line. That's what I was just going to say. So he comes from an aristocratic bloodline. They are serious blue bloods. So the this Percy line, the Dukes of Northumberland, the Percys, um, it's known as a female line because remember in the Douglas side, there were only two times the Douglas Hamilton side, there were only two times where the only heir was a daughter. And we saw what happened both times. One time they hyphenated the name with the Douglases, and the second time he gave the title to his fourth cousin. But I, apparently it happened so many times on the Percy side that it's now known as a female line. Every time a uh, daughter, an heir daughter married, the husband took the Percy name. So they never hyphenated it, but it is known as a female line. Going back through that, I found this Henry Percy, the ninth Earl of Northumberland. And it got my attention because his nickname was the Wizard Earl. He was known as the Wizard Earl because he had a large library and because he was patron to many, many scientists. And that included a Thomas Harriet, who was said to have invented binary notation and arithmetic. Okay, hold on a second. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Say that again. Okay, Thomas Harriet was said to have invented binary notation and arithmetic. So I'm thinking, okay, Henry Percy's encoder was named Thomas Harriet. (laughs) Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Gets your attention. It sure does. And I'm reading here on the bottom right, the Wizard Earl. It says, from his scientific and alchemical experiments. Yes. So, of course, following back, it gets old. You can't follow the line back. I just ended up jumping right to who who founded this, the House of Percy. I just went to write who founded it. And it was this... William de Percy. Now, he he arrived in England the year after the Norman invasion. So 1067, he arrives in England and becomes a feudal land baron. 1067, 900 years before Sergeant Pepper. And that brings up the line, it's the only whisper message. It's written backwards. And it says, Monsieur, Monsieur, how about another one? That makes me think of the cover of Abbey Road, the license plate on that Volkswagen Beetle says LMW 28 if maybe it means Le Monsieur William, two plus eight is 10, I is the ninth letter, F is the sixth letter, 1096, William de Percy died in 1096. 
Now, when I first saw this, it gave a death date of 1096. Now you can see someone added a nine. Yeah. But it wasn't that way when I first found it. How odd for someone to add a nine. I mean, like, well, especially for this entry, because how many people are looking up William de Percy? Yeah. And, and who's going to mix up a six with a nine? Well, we're reading these old documents and we don't know if this is a six or a nine. So, so you think the license plate on the Volkswagen on the cover of Abbey Road is a clue yeah. Yeah. to William de Percy's death, the year of his death? Yes. And that that message says backwards, it says, Monsieur, Monsieur, how about another one? And of course, when he arrived in England, it was exactly 900 years before Sergeant Pepper came out. So how about another one? Connect that dot for me. Meaning what? Another William. Here's another William. I don't know. Does he think he's reincarnated from William to Percy? How about another William anyway? 900 years later. So right now what we have, Stacy, just so I can collect my own thoughts, we have two lines coming together, two lines of ancestry, family tree, whatever you want to refer to it as. We have the Hamiltons and we have Percy. Yes, the Douglas Hamiltons. And Douglas Percy. Hamiltons, right. And Percy. And Percy. Two very powerful lines, each in their own right, ancient lines. And the Douglas is going back to the 1200s and the Percy's going back almost a thousand years. So now I think maybe this isn't his stepmother. This might be his mother, but it's all still speculation. Back to that line. My mother called Mary here like Paul's died when I was young. Maybe we should read it as my mother called Mary here for the purposes of this book. Like Paul's died when I was young for the purposes of this book, because Elizabeth didn't die until 2008. So, okay, so explain that some more to me, because I don't think I'm getting it. Well, that line on page 20 where he says, my mother called Mary here like Paul's died when I was young. It makes you just think, well, we're never going to know who she is. I see. With all of this, all of these clues, I'm starting to read it like this. My mother called Mary here for the purposes of this book. Like Paul's died when I was young for the purposes of this book. I think it's to get you sidetracked from just accept that she's gone and we'll never know her. But now I think this is her. Here's a picture, young picture of Elizabeth and Mary. Now they have different coloring. Elizabeth was very, very blonde, as blonde as Linda. Blonde eyelashes, eyebrows, very blonde. This is Elizabeth Percy? This is Elizabeth Percy when she was very young. And Mary... Billy's daughter, Mary, and there's something about the look in the eyes, maybe the mouth. I don't know. Of course, she didn't die till 2008. So there's Elizabeth as an old woman. I mean, look at the eyelids, the mouth, and the jowls. I think this is his mother. She married Douglas Hamilton in November of 37, and they had five boys together. Okay, and so if Billy's illegitimate, why would he look like her? I'm saying they had Billy and in 37, and then they married in late 37. Got it. Got it. So she had Billy before they married. Before they married. And they had five boys. And now that's not his stepmother. Okay. I went down a different path. I was thinking that his father had a paramour. Yeah, I thought that for a long time, too. <laughs> but you're saying, no, it's very possible that his mom is his father's wife, but they so had the baby he, before they got married, out of wedlock. Yeah, he's so he could never get the title. Today, he would be the 15th Duke of Hamilton, but his parents weren't married the day he was born. All they had to do is be married the day he was born, and he would he'd be the premier, premier peer of Scotland today. Curious that they didn't get married. So for confirmation, again, another music video, this one made in 1980, Waterfalls. I've watched that video many times. You, when you watch it, you just know there's a lot going on in that thing that you don't understand. Yeah, I watched it too. Yeah, a lot of symbolism. And I'm watching that thing. And, uh, you know, it's a very sad song with this 
oddly comical the video has this oddly comical ending after the music is over he turns out the light and you hear uh garbage cans crashing and then a cuckoo clock and it seems out of place because the song is so sad and why is this comical ending well then i started to wonder about about the cuckoo birds uh, i looked up cuckoo birds to find out more about them there's a species of cuckoo bird called a brood parasite and they lay their eggs in the nests of other species for them to raise so very tragic ending given what happened to him then i'm watching it again and i see this part where he closes the window her name was elizabeth ivy percy and that window surrounded by ivy <laughs> looking at the window you know there's such such a thing as Edwardian fashion and Victorian architecture. Is this an Elizabethan window as in Elizabeth the first time period, timber frame window? I looked it up. It is. What makes that an Elizabethan window is the grate in the glass. Elizabeth Ivy, that's his mother. And when you think about that, Christmas time came out in 79. He was arrested in Japan in 1980 and came out with this music video in 1980. I think he was going through a lot in 79, 80, taking the, the risk in Japan. And, and he says he doesn't know why he took all that marijuana into Japan. Didn't make sense to him, but maybe he was just going through a lot. Yeah, he was having a moment. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, you'd think I'd be satisfied with all of this, right? But what drove me crazy is why would an alpha male like Douglas Douglas Hamilton, who was 34 years old, had a pregnant 20, 21 year old girlfriend, why would he not just marry her to make sure his son, if it was a boy, got the title? Why would he do that? And I found that in May of 37, Elizabeth is second from the left. She was in the coronation as a maid of honor in the coronation in May of 37. On the right is Helen. She was the queen mother's mistress of the robes until Helen died in 1967. That means she was in charge of wardrobe and jewelry for the queen mother. So maybe what happened is Helen really wanted her daughter to be in that coronation. Well, you can't be a married woman and be a maid of honor. You have to be a maiden. And maybe that's why they didn't get married. And also, for people that are in their circle, but not in their inner, inner circle, it's the perfect excuse to explain why you didn't get married. They could say, well, you know Helen. She was determined that her daughter's in that coronation. So what were we to do? We just didn't get married until late 37 so our firstborn son is illegitimate he could never get the title interesting so to make sure i understand these images here so the second to the left on the left hand side that image that is who that is elizabeth ivy percy douglas hamilton that would be billy's mom billy's mom of course at the time she was elizabeth ivy percy she hadn't married yet and that's the coronation in May of 1937. And on the right is? Is Helen, Elizabeth's mother. Um, she was mistress of the robes to the queen mother. So she was in charge of wardrobe and jewelry. So maybe she just really wanted her daughter to wear a dress that day. She really wanted her daughter to be in that coronation. The reason why I got a little confused is because the image on the right is in color. Yeah, it was colorized later. There's a black and white. The original is black and white. But I liked this colorized because you can see more detail. Okay. Um, That's why I got thrown a little bit. Yeah, she was a beautiful young woman, Helen. She didn't maintain her beauty, but she was a beautiful young woman. And I think that's where Billy got his height and his long legs. She's a very tall woman. I mean, look at the distance between her hips and her knees. She was long-legged. And then there's that necklace. It's an eight-spoked wheel, like a Yule wheel. That's a pagan necklace. And it makes me think of how he said uh, Helen was the one that entered his name in the family Bible. 
Well, now I wonder what kind of Bible, certainly not a King James Version. And when it says, um, I was the son of the magician, maybe it's the maternal line, like the Percy line is a female line. Maybe Helen's the magician. I don't know. Um, also, Hel Helen, she was the daughter of the Duke of Richmond. The Duke of Richmond family seat is called Goodwood House. It makes you think of uh, Norwegian wood, where the line goes, isn't it good, Norwegian wood? Now I wonder if that song has anything to do with Helen or something that happened to Goodwood's, Goodwood House, but that's neither here nor there. You know, going back to Son of the Magician, just to mention it, another indicator that Crowley is not his father it came from another researcher, Wendy, who's been on some of the roundtables. Billy has this whole role where he claims in the book that he's playing the role of Horus, the Egyptian god Horus. And uh, of course, his mother as Horus would be Isis. And Isis was known as a great magician. Mm. So he would be the son, because if he's Horus, of the magician, because Isis would be his mother. So I just want to point that out as well. That's another indicator, another clue that Crowley is not his dad. Yes, I didn't know that. That's interesting. I don't know if you ever noticed, but sometimes in uh, Viv's music videos, he'll sort of crinkle his nose and smile with his top and bottom teeth, kind of in a jokey smile. And there's Helen on the left making the same face. They look a lot alike. I think they do look a lot alike. Even the nose looks alike. I mean, she's got a bigger nose, but the shape is very similar. Yeah. He looks like Helen. Now, there's only one picture I can find of this family. It's Douglas, Elizabeth, and their five boys on the left. The young boys are wearing those Scottish knit sweaters. And then, of course, in Waterfalls, Billy, who's trying to look sort of like a young boy, he's wearing a knit sweater vest. Wonderful Christmas Time was made in 79. Waterfalls was made in 1980. He looks younger in waterfalls. It's almost like he was trying to look like an early 50s teenager. The thing I noticed about with waterfalls also, Stacy, is his hair is part on the right side of his head, where normally it would be on the left side. And I think you're right as far as trying to look younger, because one of the things I noticed in that video is his skin, his facial skin looks very, very smooth, which leads me to believe that there was a lot of cosmetics, perhaps latex that was applied to give him a very, very young look. Those were my thoughts when I watched the video because he looks very young there. He does. He really looks like he's trying to look like a teenager in the in the, the clothes. I mean, those pants, there's no belt loops, like pants you'd put on a young boy. His dad doesn't look very tall to me. No, his dad wasn't tall and he was short legged and his mother was tiny too. I think he got his height from Helen. And his long legs from Helen. So from his grandmother. From his grandmother, for Elizabeth's mother. She's a very tall woman. And now I'm thinking, because this photograph, it's not a professional photograph. They would put out a more formal pose. I wonder if young Billy took this photograph. I don't know. And it's interesting, it's the only one you can find of the whole family. Well, who put it online? Maybe it's Billy's picture. Maybe he put it online. I don't know. Yeah. So we've talked about this before. Four to nine. There's four letters in Paul. There's nine letters in McCartney. Well, William McMillan, there are 15 letters. In Douglas Hamilton, there are 15 letters. Also, in the late 50s, early 60s, there was a prime minister of the UK. He was a Scot named Harold McMillan. And his nickname was Super Mac. So maybe this means William Supermac. Also, Billy's fourth classical album was called Ecce Cormium, Behold My Heart. And this is the, on the left is the program for that, for one of the performances. And you can see M-C-C -C for McCartney. You can also see M-E for me. Flip it upside down. And you can see a W for William, an A, I think, for Alfred after his paternal grandfather, D for Douglas, an H for Hamilton, and then a lowercase p for Paul. So I think his birth name, illegitimate or not, I think his birth name might be Lord 
William, Alfred, Douglas, Hamilton. Now, Elizabeth and Douglas married in late 37. Their firstborn son was Angus, and his middle name is Alan, which is Elizabeth's father's name. Oh, and then there's this. So one dot on the side for Billy. Five on the top, maybe for his five Douglas Hamilton brothers. Three on the side for the other three Beatles. And that, Mike, is that. Very good, Stacy. Seriously. So just to recap, Billy's father is Douglas, Douglas Hamilton. His mother, Elizabeth Ivy Percy. His grandmother was Helen Percy. Helen Gordon Lennox Percy. She was the daughter of the Duke of Richmond. Okay, so his grandmother was Helen Gordon Lennox Percy. And Billy's birth name again, what do you believe it is? Billy's birth name is Lord William Alfred Douglas Hamilton. He's illegitimate, so he can't get the title, but he still was born a Lord. But wow, hey, this is crazy. You know, you know why this is so crazy? It's because <laughs> these are names that nobody's talking about that I know of. And it takes a little time to get your head around his family tree. When did his grandmother pass away? Helen? Yeah. 1965. Okay. So in the book, he says that there was a woman that was his advocate. A woman of renown. A woman of renown. That's right. I think I know who that is. I thought maybe it was his grandmother, but you think it's somebody else? Yes. I, I think it's Diana's grandmother, Lady Ruth Fermoy, who was a renowned pianist in her day. And she was the one that identified him as a prodigy. Remember, it says that in the book. The woman of renown is the one that identified him as a music prodigy. Well, in Rocky Raccoon, it says she and her man who called himself Dan, Lady Ruth Fermoy, she became a lady when she married Maurice Fermoy. I think his name was Maurice. He was a peer in Ireland in the peerage of Ireland. He was a peer. So she and her man who called himself Dan, he's a Danny boy. Her name was McGill. Ruth's maiden name is Gill. She called herself Lil. Ruth's mother's maiden name was Little John, but everyone knew her as Nancy. And Nancy means grace. And you know, they would call those people that outranked them, yes, your grace, no, your grace. They would ad address them that way. So I think... It was Lady Ruth Fermoy that's the woman of renown. And uh, maybe you'll find this interesting. Through his grandmother, Helen, the Richmond side, he's like something like fifth cousins with Lady Diana. So before we head out, Stacy, I just want to say that you did a fantastic job with the research. I find it to be very compelling. And I think it's possible that you may have broken the code as to who are Billy's parents. So Stacy, again, thank you so much. I am very happy that you reached out to me. I'm glad that we finally got to cover this topic. I know it's going to be of keen interest to the audience and you have an open invite to come back at any time. It was a great presentation. So thank you very much, Stacy, and I'm sure we will talk soon. Okay, well, folks, I have a great show. And I have two guests who have been in the music industry and know a little something about it. And so we're going to talk about what goes on in the music business, and they're going to share their experiences. I'm going to be in host mode, and I'm going to give my guests the floor so that they can tell us about their experiences. And I think this is going to be, in fact, I know this is going to be a very insightful show. So with us is Doug and Paul. Welcome, guys, and thank you so much for accepting the invite. Thank you, Mike, very much. This is going to be fun. Yeah, and the way I, I got in touch with Doug and Paul is uh, over the years, they have been very, very insightful with their comments. And uh, I always say to my audience, guys, that there are a lot of musicians, songwriters, sound engineers, and even some producers that have stepped forward that – have shared their information and their experiences in the music industry. And a lot of them cannot step forward because they're still in the business. Believe it or not, talking about this topic, talking about the Beatles as an example, 
talking about it in terms of uh, other than the official narrative could get them into trouble, believe it or not. Oh, I believe it. But in any case, uh, you guys don't have that concern. I don't have that concern, so we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. <laughs> so what I wanted to do, and I'll start with Doug first. We'll go in alphabetical order so we don't step on each other. Doug, can you give a, a brief overview of your music background, your experiences um, as an artist, being in a band, whatever it is your capacity was when you were in the music industry? Absolutely. Well, as many of people started off very young, so I started off playing drums and guitar at seven years old. My parents were actually smart when I asked them if I could take drum lessons after seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, not at the time because it was a rerun. They said, sure, we'll give you drum lessons, but you got to take guitar lessons too. And so I said, okay. Um, so I did. So I learned guitar and drums. When my other friends were out playing, doing basketball and football and all that stuff, I was practicing hours and hours and hours and hours on end to be a better musician. Um, when I was 15 years old, I went into my first professional recording uh, studio. I was playing with a Lutheran church group, actually. Uh, it was a choir and a combo, and I played the drums, and we were recording a records so that we could sell them to do our bus tour during the summer to play all these different uh, uh, churches. So that was my first experience in the recording industry. Uh, when I got out of high school, my I got into my first professional band um, that made an album, a rock album, and uh, we did fairly well for a while. Um, but the one of the questions you had on your questionnaire there, Mike, was uh, things that happened in the music industry when you were coming up in it that made you go, you know, I'm not sure this is exactly where I want to be, or it gave you pause. And and the very first record that I made uh, had some situations where I really realized that maybe this wasn't what I wanted to do. But that band fell through. I got into another band in the 80s, also made an album. Just as we were starting to play and open up for bigger acts like Red Hot Chili Peppers and uh, Mike and the Mechanics, I believe, the two of the members decided that they didn't want to do it anymore, and they split, and they left town. And so they left this high and dry. Um, then I went and started working again with another Christian group, um, and they had a small label, and I recorded with them. And we were going to supposed to do a uh, a recording or, or or basically a showcase for Island Records. And there was like five of us in this in this place called the Warehouse Ministries, and we did the the showcase and. Uh, they only wanted one of the bands, Charlie Peacock. He's now in Nashville actually producing records. Um, we all had records that were re ready to come out, and they said, we only want you. And Charlie Peacock said, if you don't take all of us, I won't go with you. So he said, okay. So they took us all, and then they shelved us all, which meant we had a record ready to come out. We had a video ready to come out. We were ready to tour and they said, you can't do anything until we say you can do something. And all they did was promote one group, Charlie Peacock. And so that made it very difficult for us, the rest of us, to do anything. So by that time, I was pretty much fed up with the music business. Um, I ended up got married, had my first child, went back to school. Um, and I'm now in physical therapy in a major hospital in Sacramento and do wound care. I just started a business six years ago doing video production work. So I do commercial video production work. And the weird thing is, is that I decided to do a film documentary on the music scene in the 80s in Sacramento here. So I'm working on that right now. Um, so kind of coming back full circle, but um, it's been quite an interesting ride, I can tell you that. So that's that's a brief history of, of what I've done. Excellent, Doug. Thank you so much for sharing. And Paul, how about yourself? Yeah, Mike. So I'm a, I'm a bass player of 40 years. This is my 40th year. My grandma bought me my first real bass back on my 17th birthday, way back in the day. You know, I also play drums and guitar. You know, I've studied sound engineering and music production, and I've just, I've always been into it. So, I mean, I've just been more of a gigging and, you know, working bass player. I played my first concert in 1986. You know, I played as recently as last year and the whole time in between. So I've always been in original bands. I mean, I joined an original band in the 90s and I've, you know, it's something I've always done. Something I'll probably always will do as long as I'm able, you know. Okay, Paul. And who were your musical influences as you were growing up? getting into music what bands or artists influenced you that it's funny now because you ask that question and you say who were they really right 
<laughs> it was Tavistock. <laughs> right? That was my favorite band. That's really kind of bothered me now. Is like, you know, when people ask me who my influences are, I'm like, I, do I know? But, you know, we'll go with the official answer. And yeah, I first started playing when I was in high school. And, you know, it was kind of in the 80s and there was metal was kind of the scene. And I was into metal. But then, you know, I got my first bass and I, I anciently kind of gravitated back towards the classic rock bands I grew up listening to. My parents were big Beatles fans. They were big Creedence Clearwater Revival fans, yep. Paul McCartney and Wings. So all of that, I'm a big Zeppelin fan, Cream, Deep Purple. Like that's the kind of stuff I, I cut my teeth on. Well, I have a big smile on my face because you just named all the bands <laughs> I was listening to. <laughs> Doug, how about yourself? You mentioned the Beatles earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but going back to when you said Credence, I got a big smile on my face because they were really the first rock band that I I had gravitated towards. I remember putting the eight track tapes in my uncle's uh, blue van and just sitting there just being mesmerized by by the sound. And and, and that's really what made me want to get into the, the business. Uh, the Beatles were the first I can consciously think of made me aware that music was something that could be attained, that 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 there was something about it that that resonated with me, you know, five, six years old. But but when I heard Credence and and, and Elton John and, and and groups like that, it really made me go. You know th that's kind of what I want to do. I want to go that route. So um, growing up, you know, obviously Zeppelin. You know, I wasn't really a big Stones fan. I, you know, uh, um, I can appreciate some of their stuff, but I really wasn't a big Stones fan. But uh, when Van Halen came out on the scene, that really changed everything. I mean, it's like wow. And when you heard Eddie Van Halen play those riffs. And that sound, it was just, uh, it, it changed in my life, you know, just w the direction entirely. Yeah, Eddie was one of those guitar players where guitar playing took a pivot. Oh, without a doubt. There are some, maybe four or five in my mind, guitar players that changed the landscape. And Eddie was one of them. That's not to say that there aren't a lot of great guitar players. You know, Joe Pass was one of my favorite guitar players, and he was, you know, jazz player. But you you listen to some of Joe Pass's work on Virtuoso, and you listen to Eddie Van Halen stuff, and it's almost as if Eddie Van Halen had some influences from Joe Pass, the tapping. He has a very unique sound, too. I mean, very few players have such a distinct sound as Eddie Van yeah. Halen. If you, You'd recognize it instantly. Right. Sometimes my brother and I will go through who we believe were – guitarists who were turnkey. They, they just changed, like I said, the landscape of guitar playing. Chuck Berry. Oh, absolutely. Jimi Hendrix. Oh, yeah, no doubt Jimi Hendrix. Jimmy Page. Yep. yep. And talk about a studio musician. That guy was a studio musician before. 17 when he started doing studio work. And he had to teach himself to read music in order to do the, uh, the session gigs. Let me see. Who else? Um, I'll put Eric Clapton in there as well. Yep. And uh, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, those those are the big ones right there. Now, there's been a lot of guys that come after them that could do some things that some of the guys couldn't do. But as far as revolutionizing the instrument, I would agree with all of those. Okay, Paul, any thoughts? Anybody different that you might throw into the mix? I would also uh, throw in Richie Blackmore. Ah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That real heavy sound. He had such a heavy sound. Yeah, it just for that was uh, a lot of people will say that you know, Sabbath was the first metal band, and they probably were, but I think uh, Deep Purple was Deep the first Purple. step. So those are the people that uh, influenced me, too. You know, I'm a bass player, so I'll, a lot of times I'll be looking at the bass players in those bands, and it was like Jack Bruce, it was John Paul Jones, it was Paul McCartney in air quotes. Yep. Um, we touched on it a little bit before, but maybe we can get into some more detail what was it like when you were getting started in the music business? A point where you thought, you know, maybe I could do something with this. Maybe I can go somewhere. Maybe I can make a career out of it. What was that experience like? Well, it was right after high school. It was actually the summer after I graduated from high school. Um, and uh, a friend of mine that I'd played with with other bands in high school was playing with this group called the X-Men, which later became the group The Veil, which I joined. And they were already 25, 26 years old, and we were just 18 years old. And so 
all my life, that's just what I was planning for. I was planning on being a musician. I was planning on being a rock star. When other people were out trying to get into college or, or play baseball or basketball or football, I was just practicing everything I could and learning everything I could of my craft. And when I finally got there and I started playing with a band that was playing in multiple venues, we're playing in, 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 in uh, the Bay Area, we're playing in Sacramento, we're playing in Davis, and then recorded an album, I really thought that this was probably it. And I really focused on it. It was, a, it was an exciting time in the 80s to be music because it just seemed like music was just, there's a revolution going on from the punk scene to the rock scene to the new wave scene and all that stuff kind of melded together and and uh, it was it was it was good times, but I ended up having a really weird experience because uh, most of you, I'm sure you guys know the Jefferson Airplane and the bass player for Jefferson Airplane, the original Jefferson Airplane was uh, um, Jack Kennedy. Um, Cassidy. Cassidy, sorry. And he later played with a band called SVT, and uh, the lead singer for that group and the guitar player was a, bit, a guy by the name of Brian Marnell. And uh, all of us in the band that I played in the Veil, we looked up to him and. And he ended up coming and, and uh, our lead singer said he's going to be playing some guitar riffs and guitar tracks on our album. And we were really excited because we loved his playing. We loved his singing. He oh. was just he was a rock star in our eyes. Right. Well, when he showed up, he was not quite the guy that we all remembered him in, from the album covers. He was kind of strung out. He was, you know, a heroin addict, but he was trying to detox from it. Well, he played on our album and, and one particular track he played on was called Last of Our Kind, and it was slated to be the last song on the album. And it ended up being that it was the last thing that he ever played and recorded because that night in our lead singer's apartment, he passed away. And that really, unfortunately, you know, Mike, you've talked about the whole death for success thing. And this isn't quite the Faustian bargain death for success, but because that was the last thing that he played was on our album, it like just skyrocketed us and everybody wanted a piece of us and we were playing bigger venues. And now all of a sudden producers were coming around and knocking on our door. And it really kind of hit me as an 18, 19 year old kid. It was like, you know, this just doesn't seem right. You know, I want to be known for what we've done, not because we're riding on the coattails of somebody who passed away while making an, an album with us. So it was it was confusing times. Uh, and then subsequently from there, you know, I, I, I say, you know, that I had three opportunities in my life to make it big and none of them came through. And at the time I was, you know, devastated. But and I look back now with things that I know and I go, I am really glad that I didn't make it because uh, the music business is uh, it's a pretty dark place. So anyway, Paul, what about yourself? Boy, I would just want to say to Doug there, you, you know, yeah, definitely. You're glad you didn't make it in retrospect. I know that feeling thing that I see, like the biggest thing that was the difference in the music scene back then versus now is. You know, back then, the dream was still alive. We didn't know the things we know now. So, you you know, you went in there kind of blind. But uh, the thing that really bothers me is we were lied to. You know, we believed that there was a chance for us to make it. But, you know, my dad didn't come from military intelligence. <laughs> Strike one. We didn't know this back then. So that's it. Another thing that uh, I the biggest difference, too, was like for me, just from like a, a gigging musician perspective, is there was no internet. And boy, times were different. I don't think that's necessarily for the better, you know? Like, we had to advertise in the local papers to meet players, and it was much harder, but at the same time, it seemed like it was easier. You know, when you look back on it, it was so much easier to put a band together back then versus today with all the resources at our fingertips. It's much harder. It's much harder, and I think a big problem of that is, like, I say the market now is flooded with garage level talent and karaoke singers. Yeah. Yeah. And let, let me just go back to something that, um, that Doug mentioned. The whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll meme that's out there. I've tried to explain to folks that that's just another social engineering agenda that's out there to lure you into believing that that type of lifestyle is going to create excitement and creativity in your life. It sounds exciting when you're young. Yeah, exactly. Right, because you because you bought into the narrative. You're thinking, you know, right. this is how it is. This is what it's like to be a rock star. The problem is, and I've tried to explain this to folks, because in the comment section, sometimes I'll get the comment that drugs make you more creative. And I respond back, that is completely 
wrong Yes, on so many levels. How many artists do we know where they had to go to rehab to get themselves clean? Because if they didn't go to rehab and get themselves cleaned up, they would be dead. Or they are dead. Or they are dead, exactly. And what I found is that being under the influence is in no way a benefit to creativity. You have to have a clear head. You have to know what it is you're doing. You have to be able to think through the songwriting process, the recording process, the rehearsal process. Doug, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, without a doubt. Um, it's funny that you say that. I was smiling because I, I did. I played in a band, and, and Paul, you'll, you'll appreciate this. It was, it was a heavy metal band in high school, and we got pretty popular with the... Um, the sorority groups and the uh, frat houses, they would invite us. We're just high school students, and, and they liked us so much that, you know, we, we started going to the frat parties and playing. And uh, I remember when I first, you know, can we say that we did drugs on this show? Yeah. Oh, okay. I had my stint with drugs, and we were trying to write some really heavy stuff, man. So we decided, you know, well, we better be smoking some pot. And uh, we thought we were writing some of the best music ever. And then when we, we, you know, recording it on a little boom box, and then when we listened to it when we were straight, we thought, that is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. And so we, we soon stopped doing that in order to write. But you're right. It's like the, 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 the lure of it, the lure of the, the sex, the drugs, the rock and roll. As a teenager, you know, that, that's, you know, you want that power. You want that, that, that popularity. And, and, and if this is going to give it to you, then that's, you know, that's what you push for. It's funny because I read an interview that Eric Clapton did. It was many years after he was with Cream. He was talking about a particular concert that they did. And he said that he was so wasted. He said the crowd is screaming and everybody's carrying on. But when he listened to the playback, he wasn't playing well. The crowd got caught up in the moment of the concert. But Eric was looking back and listening to his performance and saying, no, nah, this is not working. You know, anybody that thinks they play better under the influence, is either lying to themselves or they've never gotten their head clear enough to analyze, in my opinion. You know, it's one thing you want to tell me that maybe you get lose some inhibitions and get creative, but nobody plays better. If you're trying to be technical about your craft, there's no way yeah. you're slowed down. That's perfectly said, Doug, because it is a craft. You're working very hard. You're trying to grow your skills to be a better songwriter, a better musician, a better sound engineer, a better producer, whatever. You're not going to get there if you're going to be in an altered state of consciousness. It just doesn't work. As far as connections and networking in order to either be able to get your foot in the door to record or to even get yourself booked in a venue, a decent venue. So Paul, what was that like for you? You know, I think back to when I was Earlier in my career in doing this, I mean, I was just naive, you know. I kind of, one thing, one thing about being a bass player is if you're pretty good, you can always bat, like, over your level, you know. If you're a C-level bass player, you, then, like, the B-level bands are hiring you, and so on and so on. So a, a lot of times for me, it seemed like it was really easy. Like, I just started playing shows right away, and my services were always in demand. I, I could put an ad on Craigslist right now and get two or three replies before this interview's over. I mean, I had that going for me, but I mean, to actually make it or play somewhere big or get recognized, I don't think you're getting anywhere if you don't know somebody. Yeah, that's exactly right. How about yourself, Doug, as far as getting your foot in the door and playing venues? Did it just fall in your lap or did you actually have to work to make things happen? Um, in my case, you know, you had to work um, in the sense that when we were talking about, you know, not having Internet and, you know, you didn't have the social media and all that stuff, trying to get people to come to your gigs. I remember hanging flyers on telephone poles or on my yeah. bicycle. And that's how you and you had your spots where you knew people were going to look. And then there usually there was a 100 old flyers that you were pasting years up over. Um, things like that. As far as getting to the next level, because it's one thing to play in your local area and your local venues and everything, but to to make it to get to the next level, you did need to know somebody. And and I always thought, you know, as a kid, and I don't, Paul, correct me if, if you you was the same way, but if you just did the work and if you just worked hard and people recognized you as being a good player, you were going to make it. And then 
when you get there, you realize, no, uh, uh, more than 80 percent of it is being in the right place at the right time. And that's what they need right now, because the music business is a business. If you're not what they're looking for right now, then they're not going to even give you the time of day. You, you've got to be, you know, either moldable, like we'll do whatever you ask us to do, Mr. Producer, or you're what you're what they need right now. And if you're not any of those things, then you don't have a chance. I learned the hard way going back to the late 70s and the very early 80s. We did demos and I sent them out unsolicited to the record labels. To garbage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a letter back from them that says, we do not accept unsolicited material. So what did I learn from that exercise as a young guy? I learned that you've got to have connections. You have to be networked because I was under the false premise as well that, hey, as long as I'm writing decent songs, good songs, and somebody's going to want to listen and give me a shot. But that's not the case at all. So uh, unless you're connected and unless you're networked, it's not going to happen. It's like I said earlier about, you know, the dream still being alive is we thought, well, you know, if we work hard and we play good music and we write good songs, someone will hear us and then, you know, it'll just happen for us. And that was what we grew up believing. Yep. But that wasn't the case at all. And uh, it's like Doug said, if you're not what they're looking for at that moment or you can't become it, I mean, they won't even remember your first name. You know, it's interesting. The reason why we believe it is not because we're naive. I mean, we're naive in a, in a way because if we knew then what we know now about how it really works. I'd have become a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> but their stories play it up. Right. These bands come from nowhere. Oh, yeah. They're poor. They struggle. And so, you know, we're buying these stories. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. Remember the, uh, what was it, the, the VH1 series, Behind the Music? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Those stories are put out there. Those are the narratives that I always talk about that shapes your thought. It shapes what you believe. <laughs> they were lying to you from day one for the most part, right? right. Yeah. I, I believed everything about the Beatles narrative until I accidentally stumbled upon your channel. Accidentally. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And you're still here. A lot of people who stumble <laughs> on my channel tell me they hate me. I had one comment come in the other day. It was really funny. He said, Mike, I don't even know you but I f***ing hate you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's an exact quote. Bad. <laughs> I, had a, I had a laugh. I swear to God, I was laughing. If he meant it in jest, you know, that's one thing, because in a way, you, you do burst a lot of people's bubbles. Yeah, I don't think it was in jest. <laughs> There's a lot of triggered emotions and anger with this stuff. The thing is, I try to explain to these folks, I had the same response initially. I loved the Beatles. The Beatles were the reason why I got into music, why I wanted to write music, record music, and all that stuff. Yeah. So when I first got into it and started figuring out that the story wasn't exactly the way we were told, that was back in 2016, yeah, it was a hard pill to swallow. For sure. Yeah. You know? You know? So, well, in any case, let me ask you this question, Paul. What do you consider to be your biggest success in music? When you look back at it, you say, well, I'm really glad, I'm really happy that I achieved whatever it may be. What, what would that be? Yeah, so uh, that, that's, that's pretty easy. I was, uh, I had a song that I produced back in 2003 that made its way onto the radio in Washington. And it was not on the big, you know, classic rock stations, but on the local stations. And it got regular airplay for over a year. And uh, I had a relationship with the DJs that were playing it. And they were calling me and saying, what else do you got? And, you know, I had my own business at the time. And it was, you know how it is. If you have a full-time job and it's, or if you're running a business, it's like two full-time jobs. And I just, I couldn't get the music thing happening. But that was clearly my, my proudest moment. I got interviewed on the radio and my mom got to hear it. So that was, that's my number one moment. How about you, Doug? Well, it's kind of funny because I was thinking about that. I was looking at the, the outline. And, and to, to be honest with you, it was playing at the California State Fair. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I went to the fair uh, and I'd see all the bands playing there. I was just like, I went, that's what I want to do. And then when the very first band that I played with that played there, we ended up playing there eight years consecutively. And we started out in the small stages and then ended up into the big stage, uh, the seventh and eighth year. And 
to me, that was the even the best thing because it was something that I remembered as a kid that I can go, I want to play there. And then I ended up doing it. But the real big success just happened this Christmas. And that was that my grandson, who's eight years old, uh, came up to me and he said, I, I want to be a musician like you, Papa. And I said, um, OK, um, well, we've got to practice. And he said, OK. So he sent me a a uh, video message late at night and he was just singing these lyrics and, and they didn't make sense, but it was just so honest. And I said, I'm going to write a song with those lyrics and then I'm going to bring him and we're going to practice this song and play it for everybody for Christmas. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, I'm getting choked up. That's awesome. It was to do that with my grandson. That's awesome, Doug. Was, was awesome. And he made the lyrics. And so I was like, that was cool. Congratulations, man. Yeah, that's a great story. I can't beat that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? These are the stories that matter, you know, not not selling your soul to sign on the dotted line with right. some major label, you know, that's right. like that moment for you and then my song getting on the radio. Right. Like, those are the things that matter, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because every step that you take to get to the next rung you have to sell a little bit more of your soul. Some people can do that. And I just got to a place where it's like, no, I can't do that. That's the, you know, if that's what it takes to get to the next level, then I guess I'll stay at this level because that, that was not for me. Well, let me ask Paul, was there a moment when you realized that the music business was not at all what you thought it was? In other words, you sensed that something was off. Yeah, well, you know, I thought it was what I thought it was for, you know, most of my life. And uh, not to kiss up to you, Mike, but it was discovering your channel that really opened my eyes to what is going on. And uh, it was really an accident. To, I don't know if you remember, Mike, but we, we met a few years back at Flattoberfest. And I got to tell you this story. Uh, there was one summer I bought a new iMac for my studio. And I took it out of the box and I set it up and I hooked it up and I didn't have anything on there, no software, no songs, but I wanted to hear it. So I logged on to YouTube and I thought I'll watch uh, the Beatles rooftop concert. And I watched the Beatles rooftop concert and the next day, one of your Paul is Dead videos popped up in my suggested feed. Well, it's good to know that YouTube isn't entirely shadow banning me. <laughs> that, that was six years ago, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was before the shadow time. banning. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Doug? What was the moment when you thought to yourself, you know what, I don't want to do this really? Um, it was the last band that I played with that nearly made it, and that was the the when I, the Christian group. Um, when I realized that a, a record company has that much power that they can sign you because they didn't really want all the bands. There was like seven bands in this one record label. It was an independent record label. And uh, Island Record only wanted one of them. And the one guy who they wanted, he said, no, I won't sign unless you sign all of us, because that's that's what we wanted to do. So they said, fine, we'll, we'll sign you all. But then they shelved everybody. And when I mean shell, that means you can't play anywhere. You can't release anything. We had albums ready. We had uh, videos ready. We had we were ready to go and they shelved us. And so I realized that if they have that much power after all the work that we did to get there, maybe this wasn't the job or the, or the career that I want to do. So that band could not do anything unless it was approved by Island Records because they now right. own the rights to your music and the rights to where you play. And so we got some gigs, but they weren't the gigs that like, for example, we were supposed to be going over to Sweden for a big Christian festival. And I had my pass, but they said, you got to get a passport. You got to do all this kind of stuff. And as soon as we got signed, that all got shut down. Um, and they just sent the group that they wanted, which was Charlie Peacock. Um, and that was it. We didn't get to go. So that was really when I decided Mm, this isn't really what I want. Um, it started with uh, getting famous off of somebody who died while making your album, and it ended with they own you. And uh, I didn't want to be owned. So, <laughs> and I'm glad now I've, I've got a wonderful wife, two beautiful grandchildren, a ch you know, a, a child, and uh, a career that I like, and uh, still doing music and and having fun. But it's it's just you know I didn't want to sell my soul. Paul, how about yourself? What was that moment for you, or did you have that moment? Yeah, oh, I, I've definitely had it. I mean, and like uh, what Doug said, you know, I would have done anything in my 20s. 
I would have signed any piece of paper they stuck in front of me. And I'm glad that didn't happen. You know, the, the work can eventually drag on you and you're trying to make it. And, you know, you're, I've been in a couple really good bands. I was in a band called Perfect Pistol in, in Seattle. And like, you know, people were routinely saying that we were the best band in Washington, but like nothing ever really became of it. And we just, we worked and we worked and we worked and everyone loved what we were doing. And we built a following out of nothing. And, but it just, I mean, that was it, you know, I mean, we played all the venues and we did all the shows and released our demos and we had our, you know, this was in the early days of the internet. We had a little presence online, but you know, nothing becomes of it. And then the more, you know, you know why nothing became of it. Yeah. Because it's not the talent. It's not the ability. It's, are you going to do something to help them? Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, how valuable are, are you to them? Not they, They're not really into making stars as much as they're into making money. And if they, if they make a star in the process, great. But they want to be able to have control of that star. They want to be able to know that you'll do anything to stay in that position. Some people are willing to do it and others aren't. And I'm glad I'm not one of those. So, so we've touched on this now, but I'll just ask the question specifically. In your opinion, how controlled is the music industry? 100%. I mean, there's just no doubt in my mind that anybody that makes it big, most of them are bloodline and were placed in that position. There's a few, I'm sure, rare examples of people that just actually, you know, came up and got noticed, but they had to give away everything to get there. And, you know, it's it's 100% controlled. You're not going to be known. You're not going to be heard. You're not going to be seen unless they want those things to happen. Doug? 100% as well. Um, I don't, I think it started out not quite as much um, in the, in the, in the fifties and sixties and seventies. I think there was, a, there could have been a lot more organics going on, but as soon as the eighties came along, I think the manufacturing of, of super groups and the manufacturing of, of, of music that was going to uh, again, be part of the social engineering process, I think uh, really took over. Um, I saw that because I there was I had a lot of friends that ended up playing with bigger bands, and when I'd ask them, well, you know, what is it really like? And they go, nothing like we thought it was. And he's like, you, you, you're not in control of anything. You're basically here's what you do, and if you're willing to do that, then we're going to give you the next bone that that you're looking for. Um, uh, the freedom is is not there. We often I don't know about you, Paul, but you, I always thought that if you know you became a rock star, it was like you could just do whatever you want, you could get whatever you want, and 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 the people that I talked to would actually uh, get to that level. Said no, you're you're pretty much not your own person at all, which gave it all more credence for me to like be glad that I didn't make it to that level. So I made it to the grandson writing song level. That's that's my. That's my thing. No, that's, like I said, that's an unbelievable story. My, my grandson is 18 months old. And I already have a guitar for him. There you go. <laughs> um, Give him a bass. He'll get more work. <laughs> <laughs> he can work for me. <laughs> so the next question is our opinion on the music and entertainment industry today. But what I really was driving at with that question is the quality and the presentation of the music today versus when we were younger, going back to the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. You know, my opinion is it's in a death spiral. Doug, what are your thoughts? I think, well, yeah, I think so. Um, there's really a lot less musicianship. Um, there's a lot of pre-programmed things. A, a producer can just plug things into a computer, um, can produce things with that very little real talent. And I think that Back in the days when we were growing up, I think you had to know how to play your instrument. You had to know how to be on time. You know, you had to know your craft. You had to, you know, now you just need to know a computer system and what software is out there in order to make the sounds that you're looking for. You can now, I have a friend that has a studio and he showed me, you can literally just hum into a microphone, uh, whatever melody you want or, a you know, beatbox you want. And then you can use that to marry it up with real instruments or sampled instruments. And you can actually, without ever having to pick up an instrument, you can actually create an entire symphony just by 
humming into a microphone. So that's how it's gotten. And I think the music is indicative of that. And I think for me personally, I, I can't listen to modern music. It just doesn't make sense to me. Exact same thing all the way down to the production. Like I love the way the music to me sounded in the 70s. Yeah. And I hate I hate the productions today. Like every song I listen to, the kick drum is the loudest instrument. It's really bad. It's really bad. And the musicianship, as Doug said, was so much better. You know, you know, I know that sometimes you don't know who's playing on an album, but I know that Jack Bruce could really play. And I know that Glenn Campbell can really play. Right. Nowadays, it's like, I think that the, the those game shows like American Idol and America's Got Talent ruined the music industry. Like there's a whole generation of people coming up that think like, a karaoke contest is the music business, and it shows. Most of it today, we're looking at performers. We're not looking at artists. We're not looking at musicians. So when Taylor Swift steps on stage, she's a performer. Yeah, right. That's what she does, right? So um, I did a show with uh, Vince Russo, and we went through her resume, and it's, you know, <laughs> she's completely manufactured. Of course. I agree with you guys 100%. And with me, I'm very old school. So the way I came through it all... You had to do your own thing. So you had to practice your guitar. You, I mean, you had to be able to play. You had to think through melodies. You had to think about being able to do the harmonies. You had to think through what's the mix going to sound like, the dynamics of the song, all of this stuff. Yourself, not a computer. Exactly. Yeah. Yourself. Yourself. It's, it's, there's no computer. There's no technology involved. Now, don't get me wrong. Technology can be helpful here and there. Like when I write my own songs... That's just me. That's how I look at it. It's a human element. You're not a machine. You're not software. I think AI is ruining the entire landscape, to be perfectly honest with you. What did you think of the, quote, Beatles' new song, Now and Then? Oh, God. So, yeah, I mean, I only reluctantly even listen to it, to tell you the honest truth. Like, all those horrible remixes of the Red and Blue albums, are like they've ruined them. I just don't like it. You know, I it just seems phony to me. It just seems fake. I mean, uh, I don't even really buy the story behind it. It's like, didn't care to tell you the honest truth. I've heard it. I just said, eh, I listened to it one time because, I, you know, I grew up on the Beatles. I had to hear it, but that was it. I mean, I never listened to it a second time. It sounded to me, because of the technology and the AI, so overproduced. Yeah. That's my opinion. And first of all, it's not a Beatles song. Yeah. <laughs> It was a John Lennon song that he wrote, I think, back in 1977, and uh, he didn't think enough of it to do anything with it, so it sat on a shelf. Right. But Doug, what are your thoughts on that song? Honestly, I think that it was it, it was it was a contrived thing to continue to reach an audience with the official narrative, um, bringing it up from you know because. You know, like my grand my granddaughter, who's 14 years old, I've shown her I've taken her to real concerts for, for real people. You know, I've taken her to see Queen. I've taken her to see um, Tears for Fears, Duran Duran, um, groups that I grew up with. And then I've also allowed her to go to the concerts of some of the stuff that she likes. And she will honestly say, yeah, I mean, the music back then was a lot meant a lot more. Uh, and, uh, and and I think that, that when you bring AI into the situation, all you're doing is you're trying to pander to the next generation rather than it being a, a Beatles song. It, it didn't really strike me as being a Beatles song. It really just kind of seemed something was contriving and trying to continue the official narrative to a new group of people. That's all. And to acclimate the boomers to technology and AI. Yeah. That's what I kind of thought was part of the reason why it was done, because, uh, you know, the older folks would be more reluctant to adopt technology. They're kind of set in their ways. And the other thing, just to comment on it, and I, I talked about this, I think, with Billy Watson, the video was very childlike. You know, one of the things that Tavistock does is to try to bring people back into like a, a childlike adolescent mindset. That's what I thought was going on with that video. John Lennon doing all this goofy stuff. And it really, it looked like something out of Sesame Street. And when I spoke to Billy about it, he had the same impression. So almost playing on, on nostalgia. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with nostalgia. I think, you know, I'm I, personally, I'm working 
right now on a nostalgic project, going back and doing a documentary film based on my experiences and the experiences of my uh, you know colleagues and friends of the 1980s in this particular area of the world and what the music scene was like. So nostalgia is good, but if you're if you if it's nostalgia to promote something that is you know uh, uh, agenda based, agenda based, yeah, then I agree, yeah, that's not good. Okay, we're going to just shift up gears a little bit here, and uh, we've already talked a little bit about the Beatles and the official narrative. So let me pose the question this way. When you became aware that the official narrative may not be truthful, how did that affect you? How did that impact you? Was it something that you said, well, you know, all things considered, it doesn't surprise me, or were you taken back? So, Paul, let's let's start with you first on, on that question. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely taken back because uh, the first album I ever got was uh, Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl on an eight track. I mean, I love them. I, I picked up a bass because Paul McCartney can be a bass player and it's cool. And, you know, so could I. But, uh, you know, now they're like a boy band to me. Uh, you know, I I mean, I almost like go every time I hear them come on. It's like, yeah, you know, this is a great song, but I, I know that is not Ringo drumming. I know that's not George Harrison playing guitar, and yeah, it's Paul or John singing. Like I said, that just brings me back to the American Idol thing, and I just I kind of despise that. So I still like it because it's good music, but I mean, I can't tell you the last time I pulled out one of my Beatles CDs and threw it on. Doug, how about yourself? Well, a lot of what Paul said I resonate with. Um, I've gone through stages. When when I first kind of realized that there was something up, you know, there was little cracks that happened throughout my entire life with the Beatles. And one, uh, Paul, did you ever see the uh, uh, love, the Beatles' love in Las Vegas? No, I, I'm familiar with it, but I've not seen it. So I went and saw that, and I, I had mentioned this to you, Mike, in another conversation that we had had. When you walk into the theater, they're playing – the music tracks without the vocals and you're sitting down there and listening to all these Beatles tunes without the vocals. And I just had this weird feeling in my, in my gut is like, wow, these guys were either brilliant musicians or they're not playing at all. It just struck me just like that. And this was many years before I ever you know came across to your work, Mike. And it just was one of those kind of uh, moments, and I kind of forgot about it. But then there was little cracks. Um, you know, I, I read a, a, a couple of articles about um, a, a scientific team in, in, I guess it was Italy, that took old Paul McCartney and new Paul McCartney's voice and did some voice analysis and found that they weren't the same people at all. And then again, that was another uh, moment. It was like, and then when I did, when I came across uh, your stuff, Mike, you were actually uh, on the uh, – Hot Potatoes with Patricia Steer. Patricia Steer, yeah. Yeah, that was the first time that I had seen you um, because, you know, I was I was also at the same time studying out Flat Earth. And so all these things, when, when you realize that, in my opinion, the moon landings didn't happen, the other things in life are completely, you know, dishonest and they're not the way that they were official narrative, you know, claims them to be. When it came around to the Beatles, I went, well, it figures. And so... I did the same thing, Paul. I just stopped listening to their music because, it, you know, there was part of it that hurt. You know, it was kind of you, you tricked me. You, you tricked me. But I have recently gone back now and, and I've shared this with my, with you, Mike, because I've shown you some of the stuff that I've done, the Beatles covers that I've done. And I'm going back now and I'm relearning and revisiting the Beatles, not from the aspect of, well, OK, they tricked me and they weren't the band that I thought they were. But because, you know what? It was good music. Did Tavistock, did the controllers use that music to trick us and to try to funnel us into their social engineering program? Yes. But the music was good. And I can appreciate that. And and that's where I'm at with it now. Um, and yes, it was hard to swallow at first, but uh, I'm okay with it now. Another question for you that is not on the outline here. And uh, Paul, I'll, I'll start with you first. When we take a look at the Beatles timeline, we're told that they started in Hamburg in August of 1960, and they then had their DECA demo on January 1st of 1962. They then signed with EMI in June of 1962, and by February of 1964, they are this phenom that shows up in the United States. 
In February of 1964, they arrive in the United States. That's three and a half years. So, Paul, your perspective, how feasible is it that these four guys that were marginal musicians at best in August of 1960 and who showed no signs of being songwriters per George Martin were able then to get on this trajectory that landed them in America in February of 1964. How feasible is that in your mind? Well, I mean, it's um, to say it's suspect would be an understatement. Uh, you know, you can't climb that mountain in that short of time, especially when we're talking about where they come from. I mean, it's if you buy into the narrative and most people believe, oh, you know, I mean, you know, McCartney and Lennon are the greatest writers and, you know, Ringo's the best rock drummer. If you believe all that, it might be a little more feasible. But I mean, I'm sorry, I've heard them playing at the Cavern Club and like, I mean, they weren't very good. I mean, I've been in bands that were way better than that. If there's no way that you could climb that mountain. It would have taken them years, years just to get to be decent from where they're starting, in my opinion. And instead, they just went to like the top of the world. And that's just, you know, we know that they were placed at the top of the world. Doug, what are your thoughts? Well, I echo everything he said. And from, from being a musician and, and trying to, you know, uh, wrap my head around how you could go from being so rudimentary. And let's just talk about drums because that's my main instrument, although I play guitar. The hours that are spent in order to be able to get to a certain level to where you can, you know, keep time, just keep time and not have a lot of frills and fills um, takes years um, some people are just born with natural talent. But if you have George Martin saying, you know, I wasn't really impressed with these guys at all. And then three years later, they're the, at the top of the heap. Um, that's completely unrealistic. Now, if they were brilliant musicians and they just needed to be discovered, well, then, you know, there, you could fast track people through. But you can't make a musician who's marginal become phenomenal in three years, uh, in my opinion. So... What's more upsetting to me is that how much we all got fooled by the official narrative that we were we wanted so much to believe that they were what they were, that we, you know, we continue to ignore the fact that there's no way that that could happen. And I don't I think as a musician that's, you know, was raised to put your your, your energy and your effort into things and, and really work hard at it. I don't know why I didn't see it sooner. What about you, Paul? So the information was harder to find. You couldn't Very just, true. I couldn't just log on to YouTube and have them recommend me one of Mike's videos back then. I mean, you had to go out and do the footwork. So it, yeah. it was easier for them to fool us back then. But I agree with you on the drumming thing 100%. I play drums too. And uh, it, while it's not my best instrument, every clip that I've seen of Ringo actually playing drums, I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. I mean, he doesn't, you know, it's a, it's, it's, yeah, no. If I could just go back to what we were talking about, uh, to that point, if you look and you listen to the early drumming of the Beatles, and if we get to the point where we're going to talk about the, the tracks that you sent us. Yeah, we'll get there. Yep. I've, I took some notes because there was some things that just stood out to me. But if you listen to the early drumming of the Beatles, it's supposed to be Ringo. And then you listen to the song like Free as a Bird. I mean, it's just, there's no way. I mean, did he have a stroke? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, there's no way that you could go from playing Day Tripper and, and, and some of the, the frill, fills that they, he did on that and then to just be playing something so simple. I'm actually of the opinion um, that he didn't play on that, that they may have sampled him playing the kick and playing the snare because all it is is kick and snare with maybe one fill and it's real simple. And then they just they used that sample and built it as a drum machine because and you can program swing time into a drum machine. I've done it. Um, yes. And so – I don't know. I, I just think your musicianship, I was telling this to Mike and, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. When you start out as a musician, you only get better as the, port, the more time you put into it. You don't get worse. Right. And that's what I see with the Beatles is that they started out being phenomenal musicians. And then as they went through the process up through, you know, to the white, you know, white album and to, you know, let it be and all that stuff. They did, it seemed like their musicianship got worse, not better. 
I agree 100%. And I've always said that the White Album to me is like the linchpin one because that's where I feel like that's actually them playing on some of those songs. And I always hated that album, Mike. I, I just, even loving the Beatles, like the White Album to me was like, Four good songs, a couple fillers, and a bunch of garbage. Garbage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've always said that the White Album, um, in fact, I said it in my April 2020 presentation, was when we really got to hear the Beatles themselves, what they really sounded like when they recorded. And I'm talking about for the songs that they actually wrote, because right. in my opinion, outside songwriters were still being used uh, during the Billy period from 67 to 70. And it was still using uh, studio players. But you can definitely listen to some of those tracks and you can hear, well, yeah, that's probably them. Like I was listening to Birthday and I'm listening to the drumming on Birthday. Yeah. I mean, when you listen to it on the isolated tracks that we have, the backing tracks that we have. Yep. And then your point, Doug, take it back to Day Tripper. Yeah. The drumming on Day Tripper. You're going to tell me that's the same drummer? That's not the same drummer? No. It's not. Let me ask this question then, because this is going to segue into it. Uh, I, I stirred a pot, a, a big pot with Bernard Purdy. Yep. And I, I, you guys, I didn't tell you this, but I actually wrote Bernard. Did you? Yeah. Um, somebody gave me his email and I wrote him. Didn't expect to hear back from him and I haven't. <laughs> and uh, But I explained to him that I wasn't going to go anywhere with anything he responded with, but... I just wanted him to answer some questions that I had. Yeah, yeah. As far as how the fixing took place back in the day, because we're told they had two track machines. Right. But then I, I received an email from a friend of mine who's a sound engineer out in Europe, and he's connected into a professional drummer, a name that most people would probably recognize, especially out in Europe. I can't say who that person is, but they told me that that they had four track oh, yeah. technology back in 62, 63, 1964. In fact, I read an article where, I think it was Martin Drummer, where Bernard, I think the article goes back to the 1980s, and he talked about his fixing the records and talking about four tracks. But be that as it may, let me just ask this question. In your opinion, and Doug, I'll start with you, Bernard Purdy's claim that he drummed on 21 Beatle tracks, do you believe him? Uh, do I believe him? Absolutely. Um, it's kind of interesting that you say that because I actually lost a gig with a band because I couldn't do the Pernard shuffle. Yeah. <laughs> he has that real distinct shuffle. And I got I did my very best to mimic it as best as possible, but they weren't wanting somebody to mimic it. They wanted somebody to actually do it. They call it the Purdy shuffle. Yep. And I almost got the gig, but because I couldn't do that Purdy shuffle exactly. So when you listen to the early Beatles stuff and then you listen to Bernard Purdy play even to today, you can hear that shuffling a uh, uh, capability that it can only come from a, a few people, in my estimation, that can play that. The official narrative calls it the Ringo shuffle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never, heard, I've never. Hey, I've seen Ringo play live. I've, I've seen him, you know, because I saw the Ringo Star experience. You know, the, the All Star Band. Me too. And if he could play it, he certainly didn't do it when I was there. So anyway, no, I, I do believe that someone like Bernard Purdy, someone like Jim Keltner, is, is uh, you know, some of those people were the people that actually played on those on those records. So yeah, um, that's my opinion. Paul, what do you think about Bernard's claim? Yeah, well, I think you have to ask, what does he have to gain by lying? Nothing. Right. He has nothing to gain by lying, and he's stuck with that story for, what, 40 years? 45 years, yep. So, I mean, you have to believe him. And again, I mean, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's not Ringo on those albums, because I, he never does anything other than, you know, just a 2-4 on the floor whenever you see him drumming. Even with his all-star band, he tours with Greg Bissonette on drums. Yep. And then he'll go up there, he'll go up there for like a, a part of a song or a song and just do the most basic. I mean, it's the stuff that I learned when I was first learning how to get my right hand and right foot to go independent. Like he does nothing special on the drums whenever I've seen him play. Yeah, there's no there's no limb independence. That's one of the things you learn as a drummer is you have to be able to be independent in all your limbs. Good yeah. drummers need to be independent with all their limbs. 
you can't just follow one limb and, 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 and you've got to be able to uh, polyrhythm. And I've, I've never seen him polyrhythm live. And uh, most yep. of the time when he plays, he plays with the other drummer. He doesn't play by right. himself. Yeah. Even that live special that they did with Paul, with, with Billy, <laughs> and they, there was the, some sort of anniversary thing that they did, or maybe it was the President Obama's program or whatever it was. When he played, got up and played, he was playing with another drummer right. on stage. He wasn't playing by himself. Yeah, I mentioned to Doug before the show started, Paul, that I saw Ringo and his all-star band going back about, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago in Durham, North Carolina, and he's playing with another drummer. So he was up there, they were drumming together, and then he fell out of time. He stopped, and he looked over at the other drummer to count himself back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kid you not. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. He's not any good, and he's actually playing where he even does an interesting drum fill. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. You know what's interesting, though, is that his son is... Zach... When he plays with the Who, if you close your eyes, you think that that it's Keith Moon. Being a drummer, there's a lot of people who say that you know well, Keith Moon wasn't that great of a drummer. Correct yourself. Keith Moon was a phenomenal drummer. Um, one of the reasons was because he played with the vocals. If you listen to a lot of it, he would go along with the vocals rather than just chugging along with the guitar or the bass. That's why it stood out so much because he was up playing with Roger Daltrey on the vocals and conducting it from there. Um, I wonder who he learned from, though. <laughs> Maybe it was all those session players. Well, Ringo's always been surrounded by his phenomenal talent. Look at his all-star band lineup. So, I mean, he's grown up around the best musicians, and he probably did have the best teachers, but it wasn't Ringo. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, his his father could be an influence, but it doesn't mean that he's the only influence. Yeah. And his son would have been influenced by many other drummers. Zach is a very good drummer. The other thing is, I've been around studio musicians. I actually, when I one of the groups that I played in, I couldn't be part of the uh, of the recording session at the time, so they brought in a studio musician. I hated the fact that they brought in a studio musician, but when... I listened back to it, and when they told me how he approached it, they're so good at going in and listening to the band and then playing as if they were actually a member of the band. A good studio musician doesn't just go in there with their own ideology. They go in there and they listen to the music and they go, okay, how do I best fit into this and make it and make it fit? And they're good studio musicians are able to do that. So I look at the Beatles stuff and I think of how Bernard Purdy would, would fit into there. And that's what I think that good studio musicians do. They can make it sound like they're or part of the band to begin with. That's what they say about the Swampers and the uh, Out of Muscle Shoals. Yeah. They were able to do that. They were able to just integrate themselves into the music, into the band, and it created this cohesiveness. Right. In my experience, I've always said that I played with a lot of drummers, like every level, from amazing to horrible and everywhere in between. But I've always said the best drummers are the ones that play other instruments. They play piano, they play guitar, because then you know how to integrate what you're playing with the music. The guys that only played the drums, those are the ones that, you know, sounded kind of, you know, okay most of the time. Yeah, because... I mean, being a drummer, but also being a musician, it makes a big right. difference because you can understand yeah. how the music is going. You know, uh, you know the chord structures, you know what the notes are, not just what drums you're going to hit at what particular time. Right. Understanding the melody. Yep. Right. Understanding the full scope and context of the song. It brings a lot more to the table. Yeah. Yes. And it's it's obvious when you hear those guys because they're they're drumming breathes and it comes to life. Whereas, a, you know, uh, you could have all the technique in the world, but if the only drum instrument you've ever played is the drums, I, I would be able to tell the difference. I really would. You know, going back to uh, to the Beatles' early stuff and the drummers, so, you know, we all agree that Bernard definitely drummed on the, on the 21 tracks that Without a doubt. he said he drummed on. And some people say, well, because he didn't name the tracks, that his story doesn't hold water. But what they don't understand is, in an interview or two, Bernard was asked about that. And he said, well, I'm not going to name the tracks because it means money. Right. Right. So what Bernard was looking for was leverage. He wanted to get paid properly for the work that he did. Right. Uh, look, I'll hmm. keep this quiet for even longer if you just give me a little bit more money on what I already did. 
In a 1980s article in Martin Drummer, he explained that the Beatles camp finally contacted him and said that they were going to make it right, do the right thing. Wow. Wow. I never heard that. Yep. And uh, I have a, a copy of that magazine. What happened, if I had a guess, and I think it's a very good guess, is they came to a deal. And part of that deal was, here, Bernard, here's a big check. And now don't say anything else about the songs. Right, right. We can't tell you to say that you didn't drum on them because you've been saying that, right. you can't say that back. forever. But you can't talk about the songs. So that's what I think happened. He got compensated for the work that he did. He got compensated properly. And then he just zipped up and moved on. And so I mentioned before I wrote him, I think Bernard probably thought, well, I'm not going to engage with Mike because I really want this thing to go to bed. Right. Because Paul said before, you know, what is he getting out of it? He has nothing to gain from it. So he he probably saw an email coming from me thinking, oh, my God, like the last thing I need right now is this guy. <laughs> right. <You Well>, know? <laughs> I tell you, the last thing you want to do is make a deal with the Beatles camp. I mean, how'd that work out for Paul and John? <laughs> yeah. I think this one was just write me a check with a lot of zeros on it. And exactly. I, I'll go home. Right. Hmm. So now yeah, let's, let's just jump quickly to um, – to Rubber Soul. Yep. And as you guys know, that to me was the silver bullet that told me that the Beatles did not write all their own music and they did not play on all their recorded tracks. Yeah. And I said there are two fundamental issues with Rubber Soul. One is the 16 songs in 30 days. So the official narrative tells us, you guys are familiar with it, the Beatles came into the, the Rubber Soul sessions with essentially no backlog of music. And this is not something that I made up it's the official narrative. Scott Fryman tells us that's the narrative in his uh, Deconstructing the Beatles series when he uh, took us through Rub a Soul in Mark Lewison's books. He tells us that's the case, that they really didn't have anything coming into the sessions. And so we're expected to believe that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 16 songs in 30 days, which means right from scratch, it means they have to learn the song. So if John and Paul write a song, they then have to go to Ringo and George and say, here's the song. Let me teach it to you. Yep. They have to rehearse it, maybe change the arrangement, rehearse it again because you have a different arrangement, and then finally get to the point where you rehearse it enough that you feel good about recording it. And then the songs have got to, you know, you're going to put overdubs and you got to mix and all that stuff. And we're to believe that all of that took place for 16 songs within a 30-day period of time. And by the way, while they were in the studio, between that time span of October 11th and November 11th, there were days that they weren't there. There were some days when recording didn't take place because George Martin and Norman Smith were mixing. There was a day where they stepped out to get their MBEs. Yeah. There was one day they had to go do a flexi disc, and there was two days they weren't there because they were doing a TV special. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not even 30 days. That's problem number one. The second problem is the when George Martin wrapped up recording, when he did the sequencing, which was on November 16th, and the first lacquer being cut on November 17th, and then getting everything signed, sealed, and delivered out to the retail outlets by December 3rd. So from the time they cut the lacquer, the final mono lacquer, November 17th to December 3rd is about two and a half weeks. Yep. The cycle time doesn't make sense. So those are the two issues, but let's just focus first on the music. It doesn't matter whether it's 10, 12, 14, or 16 songs. That's a lot of songs to write in 30 days, especially when you've got to go through the whole process I just laid out. So, Doug, your perspective. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, that's one of my favorite programs that you put together that, that was so very well researched. And it really, any, I think anybody who who watches that particular program, I think, if they don't have doubts in their minds that the Beatles weren't exactly what they were presented as, I think that there, we can't help you. Uh, there, it, it's just that obvious. Having recorded three albums in, in my day and knowing what it takes to actually do that, and not just being the drummer, but being very interested in the process, um, you don't go into a recording studio and write songs. I don't care if you're the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Who. You've done your work beforehand because time is money in a studio. 
And we, we were saying before, you were telling me that some, some of your listeners say, well, you know, the Beatles got free studio time. There's no such thing as free studio time. Right. Um, right. When you go into a studio, you have to have your stuff down or, um, because otherwise you're wasting time. And that's why a lot of times they bring in uh, session musicians. A recording studio and a live performance are totally separate things. Uh, you, you can't even, they're night and day. When that red light comes on and you know you're recording, it's a completely different process. And so I know from personal experience uh, that there's no way that you could write five songs to the level that they produced those songs and get them out in time. So most people need to understand that when you go into a studio, you have to have your stuff down. They're not going to allow you to continue with the process if you don't have your stuff down. That's why they bring in studio musicians. Yeah, live performance is forgiving. Yeah, oh, yeah. Studio recording is not forgiving. It's precise. It's precise. And if you make a mistake, you clunk a note or whatever, you got to do it all over. And back again. then, you couldn't fix it as quickly as you can today. Today, right. you can fix somebody who sings completely out of tune, and you can make them sound like they're in tune. A drummer, you, they could not be able to play their instrument at all. And all you have to do is sample one or two of their hits and then of the drum. And then you can create. I've seen this happen. You can create a drum track after you might go into the studio and hit your drum. Okay, now I want you to test your snare drum. Okay, pam. Okay, they just sampled that. Uh, kick your kick drum. Boom. They just sampled that. And so they have sample backups of all of your drums and they can go back in and fix. Well, that wasn't quite on time. Uh, oh, let's let's move it up ahead. And they use your sample drums to actually do that. They can do that with all instruments. Back then, they couldn't do that. So you had to have it down. Yeah. And folks, when you write music, it's not just writing the music. You also have to you have to put the lyrics up on the boards as well yeah. and the arrangements and all of that stuff. So 24 hours after showing up, they had run for your life in the bag. Two days later, they had Day Tripper. I don't have it in front of me right now, but it's an absurd progression. It's just completely and totally unrealistic. Paul, what's your take writing all those songs in within a 30-day period of time? It's not possible. And look, I'm not uh, this legendary writer. You know, I might not even be good, but, you know, I'll work on one song for a month, you know, and that's if I if everything's going well. And, you know, record it. I'll bring in, you know, the best keyboard player I know and the best drummer I know. It still would take me that long. So, no, that's, I mean, it's a fabrication. And the, the reason they get away with it, Mike, is I, I wasn't even aware of this narrative until I heard you bring it up. Nobody knows. And if they do know, they don't understand the recording process. They think, oh, they've seen a band play live. They think they just go into the studio and they put up a few microphones and they play the song and it's done. Some groups, they can do that because they are that good. Got the Wrecking Crew or their Funk Brothers. <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, they have to go back and overdub quite a bit in order to get it to be polished enough to be on the radio. Even if you are a crack musician, there's the whole songwriting process. I mean, you don't get to be a crack musician until the songs are written. Right, exactly. It can't happen. It can't happen. And the creative process just doesn't work that way. I mean... I've got a backlog of like 12, 15 songs where I wrote the verse and the chorus and I don't have a bridge yet. Right. Or mm -hmm. I came up intro and the main riff and I don't have anything else. And, you know, I've got them filed away and one day I'll come up with the next part. But I mean, it just people don't understand how it, the process really works. And uh, Mike, I love that video you shared last week from PT Pop. I think everybody oh, yeah. Watch that. Oh, from Pete? Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. Pete's got five albums under his belt. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that video was concise. Not one sentence that came out of his mouth that I don't agree with 100%, and everybody that missed it should go back and look at it. Mike shared it on both his channels. How the music business really works. I, I agree, Paul. That was brilliant. There are times, guys, I kid you not, where I will pull out five different electric guitars. Sure. Yeah. To get the sound that I want. Right. Right. And that's how it works because you're, you're trying to get a sound. There's a delivery of the song. There's a presentation of the song. And you're just not going to take any old guitar off the rack and say, well, this will do. No. It's just not going to work, you know. I would use multiple acoustics on a song. One, one acoustic had, uh, like my Martin would have a bright sound and I had an Epiphone that had a darker sound. And 
sometimes I would record both of them in order to fill the song out. Right. I mean, these are all things. I mean, you might decide that you're going to use a different bass. I have a Hofner bass, which I use a lot, but I also have a Squire bass that I use that has a deeper, more resonant sound to it. So based upon what I'm trying to get out of the song will determine which bass I decide to, to pull off the rack. And the only reason why I'm, I'm saying this is because to get the audience to understand that there's a lot more to it than just showing up. Right. And Mike, you won't even know which one of those bases is going to be right for the song until you try it. You may have gone the whole process thinking my Hoffner is going to be the one, and then you'll cut the track with the Hoffner and it's not right. Then you'll have to go back and grab the other bass and do it all over again. Right. Yeah. Right. That's happened to me with the keyboard parts. In my mind, I'm, I'm thinking through it. And I'm like, oh, this is going to work. I think this is going to sound very good in the song. And then you do it. This doesn't work at all. <laughs> right? So it means you have to go back to the drawing board. Or maybe you say to yourself, you know what? Maybe the song doesn't even need a keyboard. Right. I've written songs on acoustic guitar. And then when I go down to record them, I record it on acoustic guitar. And it doesn't work. And I end up doing the whole thing on electric. And there's not even an acoustic guitar on the finished track. To add to the mix of that, so you got all those instruments. Think about producing drums. I, I actually, on one of the albums that I participated in, it took us three days just to get a drum sound. Correct. Because there are more of them. So you've got a kick, you know, an average drum set, a five-piece kit. You got a kick, you got a snare, you got three toms. Then you got your cymbals, you got your hi-hat, and you're, you're close miking those. And then you're also room miking those. And then, you're all, you know, there's, there's multiple mics that have to be phased just right. And then your drums have to be tuned just right. And then the engineer has to know how to use the proper gates and the proper compression. Back then, it was even harder where you placed the drums, how you tuned the drums, how you played the drums made a big difference. So just in the drums alone, there's just no way that in 30 days, because you listen to the drum tracks of Rubber Soul, there's a lot of depth to them. Now, you're not getting all of that because of the fact that there's a lot of other music that's on top of that. There's a lot of layers to those drums that would have had to have had forethought and not just placed a microphone over it and said, do your best. Right. right. First time I went into a recording studio, you spend the first several hours working on nothing but drums. I mean, I remember just being bored stiff, and it <laughs> takes forever to get that all set up. And I'm a drummer, and I would sometimes be bored stiff trying to get all of that set up because it's just it's monotonous. I hope I'm not mistaken on this, that with Rubber Soul, they, uh, they handed Paul the Rickenbacker. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting because – He's used to and acclimated to playing the Hofner, and now you're going to give him this big old Rick to play. Yeah. You've got to get acclimated and familiar with the instrument. Totally. And the, the Hofner has a tiny scale and a narrow neck with no taper. I've yeah. tried to get on with Hofners over the years, and I, I could just never get past the feel of them. It felt like a toy. I liked the way they sounded, but compared to, you know, my precision or my jazz, yep. I mean, the, the adjustment time... It would, no, you can't just jump back and forth between the two. Not if you're used to playing a Hoffner over. The other thing people don't understand is that because they, they'll watch a band play live and they'll think, okay, that's the guitar that they play when they record right. the album. That's the right. drums that they play when they record the album. That's, they don't understand that when you're in a recording process, like you said, Mike, you might use three different guitars on three different tracks because that's what the track calls for. Right. And each one of those has their own idiosyncrasies. You know, you go from a large body guitar, a hollow body guitar, down to something more like a Strat, the neck feels different. And that all takes time, like you said, to acclimate. Unless you're a virtuoso musician who's been playing on those instruments all your life. So let's move to the uh, the second issue with Rubber Soul. And that's the actual manufacturing process to, to get a record out to the stores. And so let me just give you some dates. Uh, you guys know the dates. This is for the audience. So the Beatles wrap up recording by doing four songs on the very last day. Yeah. <laughs> One of them is Wait, which they took off the shelf from the uh, help sessions earlier in the year. And they had the basic rhythm tracks. And they had to add overdubs. And I think, I think Paul had to redo the vocal. And so we're told that they had a marathon session and they didn't finish up until 7 a.m. the next day. So even though 
the official narrative says October 11th to November 11th is actually the recording session drifted off into the early morning hours of November 12th. And then we're told that George Martin did the song sequencing on November 16th, and they cut the mono lacquer on the 17th. Let me just try to step the audience through this. I know you guys understand this, but for the audience's sake, the song sequencing is very important because that's the order in which the songs are going to play on the album. So you have side A of the 33 RPM record, song one, track one, track two, track three, and so on. Flip it over. You've got the B-side, track one, track two, track three. So the order of the tracks is the sequencing. Without having the sequencing, you cannot print the center labels for the vinyl. The center labels for a 33 RPM record or a 45 are pressed onto the vinyl at the time that the record is pressed. It's not afterward. It's not like they have adhesive on it and they slap it on the record afterwards. Also, the album jackets... In the case of Rubber Soul, the songs are listed on the back of the album jacket in the order in which they're going to play when you play side A and side B. So you can't do any printing of anything. You can't do the center label printing and you can't do the jacket printing until you know the sequencing or the order of the songs. So if George Martin finished the sequencing up on November 16th and they cut the final lacquer on the 17th, that says they had to start pressing the records Maybe later in the day, the next, let's just say the next day, the 18th. Yeah. So in the way they press the records, they create a stamper, Yep. right? And then the stamper presses the vinyl records. And as we just said, the pressing of the vinyl records also includes pressing the center label of the, of the vinyl onto the record at the very same time. Here's the question. How did George Martin get all of those labels and all of those album jackets printed, thousands of them, in a single day? so that the labels were on standby when the EMI plant started pressing rubber sole. How did that happen? Here's the answer. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Those labels had to be in-house along with the album jackets beforehand. I think even before they finished mixing the album, because I, I encourage your audience to go out and look at exactly the process that it takes to make an album from the um, initial lacquer to then creating a mother to then creating the stampers right that in and of itself and back up from there when you actually go to make an album because you're making an analog piece of equipment you have to understand the dynamics between the cutting needle and the music that you're putting through that cutting needle and how much bass response you're going to put into that and how much treble you're going to put into that because you only have so much space on a record on each side and so you have to know how much pressure to put down because the longer grooves are more bassy, the thinner grooves and the shorter grooves are more trebly, and you need to know that stuff beforehand. That can take a lot of time. And, you know, great, George Martin, EMI, they're, they're the best in the world at that, but it still takes time to know that. So you're absolutely right. You, you have to have all that stuff done beforehand. Uh, otherwise, you're spinning wheels. He couldn't do the sequencing without clearly understanding the run times, knowing the run times of the songs, because he had a balance, like you said, Doug, both sides of the album. Yep. And uh, so what that means, the short of it is, folks, if you watch my presentations, that's great. If not, you can hear it right now. All of the songs were pre-written by outside songwriters and recorded by session players before the Beatles ever stepped foot in the studio on October 11th. Yep. And because George Martin had the songs already recorded, he had the backing tracks, he had the, the names of the songs and the sequencing, he can start the process, the printing process, to get the labels created and the album jackets created so that by the time he wrapped up the Beatles singing the vocals, because that's what they did between October 11th and November 11th. That's what I concluded. Yep. The labels and the jackets were already sitting in the plant just waiting for that lacquer to be finalized so that they can create the stamper and start pressing the records. That's how it worked. Paul, what, what are your thoughts? I think there was a, it's a, it's a brilliant analysis. And I, I'm so glad you did that because yeah. the other side of the coin where we're talking about the artistic aspect and the writing and the recording and the arranging and 
Yeah, those in the know know, but somebody not in the know could say, well, that's subjective and this and that. But the physical physics of printing the record and the labels that you've broken down, that can't really be argued. No. That's the process. It doesn't matter how bad you want to believe, you can't debunk what Mike just laid out here. It yep. can't be done. You cannot print an album label if you don't know the names of the songs, the order of the songs, and the runtime. You can't pr print out a jacket. You can't print out the label. It's not possible. And the other thing, too, is some people will argue that EMI pulled out all the stops. Look, EMI had a huge portfolio of artists. Yes. Sure. And this was the Christmas season. So to think that they stopped everything yeah. for the Beatles, it's not logical. Because for everything they stopped, that's a loss of revenue stream for them. Right. What about the ink? Back then, ink drying took time as well. So if they were, a week. Yeah. So if they were printing these, you know, uh, the, the, the record jackets and everything, uh, that would take time in just to for the ink to dry. Right. A week for the ink to dry it was a four ink process. Um, they used the rollers, and you know that's how they did the jackets. And it it took a week. And uh, you know this information came to me from somebody that has been in the business a long, long time. When I took a look at this stuff, I, I tried to reach out to as many sources as I possibly could to confirm that this is how it worked. And what I'll do at the end of this video is tack on that video I have of how the records are pressed and when the labels are applied so that people don't think we're smoking dope. So <laughs> I've seen it happen and it's, it's a process. And uh, you mess up one aspect of it and you have to do it all over again. It all has to go through a proofreader, too. The person that sets the type, he's not the final word. So he's going to set all the type and have everything ready. And then it's going to have to go to somebody else who's going to proofread it and make sure they didn't, you know, get a couple vowels reversed or uh, miss a space, you know. It, yeah. yeah. My, my grandfather printed uh, the phone book for years and years and years and years back in the day when he had to manually set the type. Well, it all has to be proofed. Yeah. yeah. The album art and all that stuff has got to be proofed to make sure that it's ready to go. In any case, those are the two issues with Rubber Soul. And what I wanted to do, uh, gentlemen, to wrap up here is we all have uh, a set of backing tracks, Beatle backing tracks. Presumably. Presumably, yes. They were sent to me by uh, a source. And we're trying to figure out whether they are the actual backing tracks, whether they are stems from uh, the actual release songs or uh, somebody or a group of people went out of their way to put a lot of effort into making very precise replicas of the backing tracks. So I'm not going to say that they are the backing tracks. I, I did find a difference in Day Tripper as an example, where um, I know that there's a note that drops out uh, in the recorded version and in the backing track, that note doesn't drop out. So right there, that tells me it's not the, the track that was released. But in any case, the point being is they are very, very good replicas of those tracks. Yeah. And for the purposes of analyzing the Beatles' music without the vocals, they are extremely helpful because the vocals don't get in the way. Right. So you can hear the guitar playing, you can hear the bass, you can hear all the other overdubs that are taking place. So, Paul, let me start with you. What was your take on those backing tracks and let's just start with the early period first. Did anything stand out to you that made you curious? Oh, a absolutely. And so the first thing I do when analyzing any track of sorts is, uh, you know, I'm a bass player by background. I always go to that. And it's not the same person playing the bass. It's just not. I mean, you can hear the stylistic difference. It's like Doug was talking about the drumming differences a while back and how you, you can just pick out the, the, the purdy stuff. You know, it's, it's not the same person. The, the, the phrasing, people have their own phrasing. You know, I could, I could play any number of styles of music and that could change, but my phrasing is still going to be my phrasing. I could change it up and I could play with my fingers or I could play with a pick and the attack and the tone would change and all that can be done, but at the core, there's a stylistic thing. And I've, I've always had an issue with the bass playing on the Beatles. I've always had an issue. Doug? Well, I delved into these tracks like 
crazy, and I could probably Mike do a whole show with you just on these tracks. <laughs> Maybe we will. Um, but one of the things, you know, the first instance I thought was that they, yeah, these were stems. And if people aren't familiar with stems, there are software nowadays that you can take any piece of recorded music and you can separate them out into their individual tracks as if they were the the multi-track recordings. You can take out vocals separately from bass, guitar, drums. It's pretty darn interesting how the process happens. And at first I thought that's what they were. So I was I was going off of that premise and assuming that. But then I started noticing the same thing that Paul has started noticing stylistic differences. And then I thought, okay, maybe it's just a different take of that song. But then as I started to getting more into it, I really realized that the stylistic approach to the music was more spot on because of the fact that the whoever did these tracks, whether it was the Beatles or whether it was studio musicians or whether it was people that did it afterwards, they spent a lot of time studying the way that they played, well, the way the originals were played. But they were just off enough that I kind of, it struck out to me. And one of those was in, um, okay, it was uh, on Day Tripper, as a matter of fact, you know, um, there's a part in, in in minute 114 and minute 116 where there's a double tap, you know, bub up, bub up. And on the original recording, it's more of a ghost note than it is a deliberate double tap. And a drummer doing ghost notes, I do ghost notes all the time. It's 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 like a Bernard Purdy type move where you're doing these ghost notes. You've hit the drum, but you're allowing the, the stick to just hit it one more little time to give that ghost note. That's different than actually doing a, a, a paradiddle or a flam or something that actually is on purpose. And I saw and heard that through most of these tracks that there was somebody was stylistically choosing to do that over it just being the way it was on the original recording. Having said that, the track Think For Yourself, I'm absolutely 100% convinced that was a stem. They took out the vocals because I listened to it back and forth. That was the original recording, uh, no doubt. And then when you start listening to some of the other ones, you know, a magical mystery tour, the bass line. And I don't know if you listen to that one, Paul. As a bass player, you might understand what I'm saying. You can be ahead of the beat. And on right. the original recording of Magical Mystery Tour, the bass line was just a little bit ahead of the beat. And yet on this recording, it was right on the beat. And so that lent me to believe that it wasn't the same sessions, at least. Yeah, I notice uh, from a guitar perspective that uh, the guitar playing on, on many of the tracks, and I'm going to right now just focus on the 62 to uh, through 66 period. It was very good guitar. Oh, playing. yeah. It was concise. It was way above the play grade of John Lennon and or George Harrison. Right. And if you go back and you listen to some of the recordings the Beatles did, you know, Hamburg and allegedly the Decca sessions, I don't know if we're going to get to talk about that some, but... Uh, I listened to those um, guitar tracks on those backing tracks, and I thought to myself, well, you know, there's, there's some pretty good guitar playing going on there. It just confirmed to me that what we're listening to are session players and not the Beatles during that time period. And from a drumming perspective, I'm not a drummer, okay? So I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I will say this. In the early stuff, the drumming was very snappy. Very. There were some very good fills. The technique was technique that... I've never heard Ringo engage it. And that is the key right there. Even when it comes to the guitar playing, even when it comes to drumming, whatever, you never heard them repeat that stylistic approach and that technical proficiency as they got older. Meaning that you never heard them play that same exact way again. It was like they, okay, we can play like that, but now we're not going to play like that anymore. Um, right. And it seemed like their musicianship got worse rather than better. And I don't know about you, Paul, or Mike, but if my musicianship wasn't getting better as I got older, then maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. I made that same comment on one of Mike's videos very recently where I was just commenting on how the music industry only signs young people when older and more experienced 
people are better musicians. So that doesn't make sense. And I, I commented that I was way better in my 30s than I was in my 20s. And I was better in my 40s than I was in my 30s. That's the way it works if you're if you're working on your craft. And even now that I'm I'm getting older, I'm I'm 56 now. And my fingers don't move the way they used to when I was younger. But I have more musical knowledge. I have a better understanding of theory. I have learned other instruments and I've learned how they interact and play together. And even though my chops may have lost a step, I'm still way better than I used to be. Yes. Lou is a drummer as well. And he said that when he listened to the tracks in the early period, he said there were definitely more than one drummer on the tracks. Oh yeah. And you can, you can tell uh, again, the styles from any instrument you, you can, like when we were talking before, I don't know if it was on this, the show or if it was, pre-show when we were talking about Eddie Van Halen, you can tell when Eddie Van Halen plays. You can tell when Jimi Hendrix plays. Now, just because these people that were on these recordings, we don't know who they were, they still have a style. And you can tell from album to album that, that there was a unique style involved in it. And I never heard any of them later on play that style again, which is odd because if you have a style, that style stays with you. Even if you right. get better at your instrument, how you approach it, you know, my drumming style will never change. My guitar player style will never change. Even though I get technically more proficient, my style is still embedded in who I am. I didn't see that with the Beatles as they got further along. They went back to their Hamburg and uh, uh, Cavern days more than they went back to their original, you know, recording days in the, in the early 60s, in my opinion. With the, uh, with the drumming, uh, we know that Andy White, the official narrative tells us that he played on P.S. I Love You and uh, Love Me Do. And I personally believe that George Martin hired Andy White to drum on more than just two songs. Maybe even the entire first album. Entire first album. Please, please be right. Bernard Purdy drummed on 21 tracks. And I was contacted by uh, a relative of the late, great session player, drummer, Ronnie Verrill. Yeah. Going back about... Oh, it was right after I released the April 2020 presentation. They reached out to me. This person had been writing me before that. And when they wrote me, you know, when certain people write and they're conversing with you, you can tell that they know more than what they're actually saying at that point in time. And uh, she told me that uh, Ronnie was a family member. Ronnie passed away years ago, but he drummed on Beatle tracks as well. So we have Andy White, Bernard Purdy, Ronnie Verrill. Who the fourth drummer is, we don't know, because what did Bernard say? There were four drummers on the Beatles music, and Bernard was referring to the early period, and Ringo was not one of them. Right. So who is the fourth? I don't know. The thing is, I have a clip of Glenn Campbell, phenomenal guitar player, and he was guest hosting the Smothers Brothers show back in, I think it was July of, of uh, 1968, two months prior to... George Harrison asking Eric Clapton to play lead on While My Guitar Gently Weeps. So two months before, Harrison has a discussion with Eric Clapton to come on in and lay down the, the lead guitar track for While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Glenn Campbell is introducing Cream, and he says these guys were top flight, top notch session players, and they played on records for the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Donovan, the Smothers Brothers, and he rattles off all these bands. Rolled right off his tongue because, you know, like, these guys all know each other. Yep. Glenn just put it out there. And like, if you listen to the McCartney uh, 321 Hulu special and you have Rick Rubin isolating the track for While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and he's asking Paul, who is Billy, about it. And, and Billy is as in awe of it as Rick. And you can tell that, at least my takeaway was, he didn't record that bass track. It wasn't him. So the question was, well, who is it? Maybe it was Jack Bruce. Agreed. It seemed awfully weird. He was like, you know, I don't even know if he realized it, that he was coming across that way, but it seemed very obvious to me that he was he was kind of backtracking. Well, you know, it was just I guess it's just what the way it sounded, you know, and it's like he wasn't going into detail that if you actually played on it. Well, you know, I turned up the treble on this one and I played it a little bit softer and blah, blah. He didn't go through any of that. No, he went through no details. Didn't even talk about what bass no. he played. He was sitting there going, oh, yeah, whoa, yeah that's, that sounds great. So that, to me, was very a very strange exchange. Yep. And I, again, I walked away thinking, that's not him playing the bass on the uh, song. There's no way. There's no way. The first thing he would have said is, like, when someone gives you a compliment on a tone like that, 
you would have said, well, you know, I was using the Rickenbacker and I was using the neck pickup and I was picking closer to the bridge. And I was going through this amp, right? Yeah, to get that gain sound, we were using this preamp and yeah, it, none of that. There was none of that. He had nothing to offer on how that track was made. He had nothing. Yeah, I agree. The thing is, once you know, you can't unknow. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you though, uh, I think more and more people are becoming aware of it, at least to the degree where they're willing to listen. There's still a ton of people out there that, you know, think uh, I'm just a nut job, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm used to it after doing it all these years, but it's just like anything else in this world. So many people believe all of the, uh, the narratives that are out there that are just pumped out of their TV set and into their heads and they just lock and load. And they just they just go with it. The example I use for folks is if you go back to the March 2020 event, that was a well coordinated yes psychological operation. Sure. How did every country, every version of the CDC and the FDA, how were they able to sing out of the same hymnal? They were reading from the same script. So the level of coordination at a worldwide level, these people think that it's not possible because they always say, "Well, somebody would have said something." Well, what they don't understand is it's a closed shop. Right. And it's, it's run by people and who take oaths to secret societies like the Freemasons. It's a big club and you're not in it. I can attest, you know, going to the March 2020, that whole, all of the transpired from there. I work in a hospital. I've worked in a hospital for almost 30 years. And I can tell you that none of what in, in my hospital, none of what they were preaching on television was going on. Uh, it was pretty much business as usual, except for the fact that we were treating it different and we were isolating people differently and we were not letting family come in and we were isolating these people and making them scared to, e to even go in with people. I volunteered to go and actually treat every single one of these patients uh, as a therapist. When other therapists said they wouldn't treat them, I said I would go in and treat them because these people were isolated and scared their condition was no different than any other condition of that same type of flu as they was the previous 27 years, 28 years that I worked in the hospital. It was just hyped up that way. And I've, I read every single PSR study that came through and they all said the same thing. There was no values to them. There was no, you know, when you go get blood values, they'll tell you how off you are by something or how many, if you, if you have a bacterial infection, how many gram stains of this particular bacteria you have. All it said was that this test or this assay cannot determine between infected, non-infected or latent infection. It can only be determined by clinical presentation, which basically means we don't know. Right. But you've got it because our little test said you got it. Yeah, and people just don't understand the, the level of propaganda and social engineering and mind control techniques that are that they're being bombarded with on any given day. They just they just don't get it. There's only two things that the entire world has ever agreed upon: the Antarctic Treaty and the jab. Think about it. I work in a grocery store, and there's still people this day walking in with masks on. I know. No mandate. Nothing. They're just they're just doing it out of their own choice. Yeah, it is what it is, right? It used to really bother me. Now I just look at them and I just shake my head. And, you know, whatever. And I go about my business. When you see people yeah. alone in their own cars and they've got a mask on, you that you know that there's something. That I, I feel bad for them because they really right. feel like they're going to infect themselves. Yeah, it's a mental health issue. I'm not trying to be funny either. You know that you have this train of thought and you're thinking this way. It's it's not a healthy way of thinking. It's not logical. It's not rational. Yet they're doing it. So let me just do this, guys. We've been at this a long time here. So are there any final words or conclusions? Uh, Doug, I'll start with you that you wanted to uh, part with. First of all, thank you, Mike. This was uh, a pleasure. Um, you know, from the from the first time I ever saw your program till to this uh, moment right here, I will say it forever. I think you're one of the most honest and trustworthy and uh, down to earth and humble researchers I've ever seen. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you and to, with you, Paul. I hope it's not the last time we uh, converse. As far as the whole Beatles narrative and, and, and what it's meant to me as far as finding out that they weren't quite the shiny penny that I thought they were, um, it's just par for the course, unfortunately, in the world in which we live in. It's, it's too bad that, that 
people can't understand that, it, you know, it's mark of an intelligent person to be able to uh, entertain an idea without accepting it, meaning that we go off with our own worldview and, 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 and sometimes we don't allow new information to come in and we get triggered when uh, our, our worldview is challenged. And yet if we just take the time to, to entertain the thought that something might not be the truth, and take the time to investigate it, that um, we might actually learn something about the world in which we live in and the world that, we, that we're a part of and that we're also responsible to be a part of. Um, and so uh, I look forward to the next challenge of what's the next thing I'm gonna investigate that may not be the way I think it is because it helps me to grow as a person. And I think that that's what people need to come away with all of this is that if you wanna grow as a person, um, you need to be able to to look at something and 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 maybe not accept it right away. Do your own research, do your own investigation, and then find out what you believe from there. But to just go off of a worldview that's been handed to you um, is, in my estimation, a reckless way to live. So. Oh, well said, and thank you, Doug. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of your support over the years with the channel, Paul. What's your take on closing this out? Yeah, well, uh, that was well said by Doug there. And likewise, it's been really fun for me, Mike. I've been uh, watching you for years now, and there's not a video you've put out that I haven't seen at least once. It's really great to finally uh, be able to participate and, you know, voice something that other people might hear. So I, I thank you for having me on. You're quite welcome. And um, we'll do more shows. And I'm sure after this, other songwriters, musicians, and people in the music industry or in the music business will, you know, they, they may reach out. Maybe we can just bring some more folks into the discussion and talk about this and talk about it from a perspective of real life and get that perspective instead of all of this other stuff that is just an illusion. Yeah. Right. So in any case, I want to thank you guys again so much for accepting the invite. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was great to get your insights and, and your feedback and your thoughts on all of the topics that we discussed. It's really fantastic. But I really do appreciate your time. And I know that uh, we've been at this now. Well, we started at 4 o'clock at 6.30, so two and a half hours. Thank you again so much for coming on. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mike. More important, she is an expert at hearing the slightest imperfection on a record surface. And should she find any... A new lacquer master from the original tape is immediately ordered from New York. After audio testing, the mold goes back to the plating tanks. It produces the most important new metal part, the stamper. This completes the cycle. Lacquer to master, master to mold, mold to stamper. The metal buildup to the stamper is exactly the same, except for one thing. The stamper is nearly all pure hard nickel. Its ridges press the playing grooves into the finished record. Now it's prepared for stamping. Ground perfectly smooth on the back. Optically center punched for the record press. Trimmed to exact diameter. and coined, given a formed edge to grasp the stamping die securely. The record press is a complicated piece of equipment weighing two tons. It molds records by compression. Our stamper is mounted on the top die. Below it, another stamper simultaneously presses the other side of the record. The record compound the finest pure vinyl obtainable is fed into the press in granular form. It is forced by hydraulic pressure into a soft plastic in just the right amount for one record. The labels are pressed right into the record. Now we're ready to roll. It has taken many steps and many man hours to get here. But a new record is stamped every few seconds. The record press automatically heats the vinyl plastic for stamping, then automatically cools it, so the record can be played immediately.
And here's the first long play copy of Romeo and Juliet. A collector's item? No. The first pressing is always carefully inspected for everything from the correct serial number to perfect centering. Then, still another playback test. And finally, the pressing of the Romeo and Juliet gets going in earnest. And for those who prefer the 45 extended play version, and for the millions of teenagers anxiously awaiting the latest pop hit, an ingenious machine turns them out automatically. It places its own labels, feeds itself the vinyl compound, removes its own records, and stacks them already trimmed. And for the fast-growing legions of tape enthusiasts, equally ingenious machines turn out duplicate copies at four times the playback speed to save time, and backwards to save rewinding. And no matter what your taste or preference in music, in the packaging area, you discover unlimited variety, the finest in sound and performance. It's so 